So we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Welcome everyone. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will uh, entertain approval of tonight's agenda. I'll move to approve tonight's agenda as presented. I'll second. Hearing a motion and a second, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, going on to announcements, I would just like to remind everyone that these board meetings are business meetings held in public. They are not public board meetings. The board is governed by Idaho Code Title 33, Chapter 5, follows our district policies, and adheres to IDAPA's rules. Uh, the time for public input is provided for the public to express themselves to the board. It is not a time to engage with the board, nor is it a time for question and answers. The board, in its discretion, may ask clarifying questions to ensure it's, it understands the input provided. However, no discussion or conversation takes place at this time. That rolls us into public input. Uh, we have Jason Hendricks. Good evening. Yes, forgive me, I haven't spoken from you a long time. Um, tonight I come to hear you, to you guys. You've done a lot of volunteering at the high school, probably over 100 hours last year. Um, I just want to bring you guys' attention the condition of the school. It's kind of like, to me, it's like not changing your motor oil in your car for 20, 25 years. I mean, I don't know if you guys are taking a walk. I encourage you to go with Mr. Neff or Mr. Derrick or something and take a tour of all the facilities of Church Spirit Lake such too. I got thinking about this when Mr. Quimby brought up about the bleachers, but it goes way deeper than that. From the sidewalks, you got tripping hazards. In the wintertime, it ponds up with water and it becomes a ski to drink and potential more safety issues. Um, I just encourage you guys to take a look. I know it's a money thing or whatever. Um, and, and my other question was the bathrooms at the high school, they're unsanitary. The handle you have to hold with your hand and try to wash. I've heard from many people say they don't even want to go use the bathroom. I don't know if that's something that COVID funds could fix. I don't know. I know Mr. Neff is the bus is the rear end. He's got paint from a parent donated for free, 15 gallons. He's going to get him repainted, but there's still a fixture in there and stuff like that. Um, but it's just, it's gross. I mean, my wife won't even go in there. She'll go in the walk her to the school to use the restroom. Um, I won't keep going on, but I can only three minutes. Um, I just wanted, I don't know if you, you know, if you guys are aware of that. Okay. Um, I, I do think Mr. Derek, Mr. Neff, Mr. Hoffman, um, their school pride and the care for the students is off the charts. And the pride of the school, I've spent a lot of time there recently, and, and just really warms my heart, I guess, to see the, the passion they have for the kids in that school. And Mr. Neff, I mean, he's I've seen him trying to get parents and stuff. I was volunteering down to redo the shop, but Mr. Atchison has been getting parents. He's another one that just off the charts, and I'm so thankful for. I helped him redo that shop, but um, thing. Um, I want to thank Ms. Meyer for your time here. Mm -hmm. I appreciated the the emails and everything and always being kept up to speed on everything. I'm sad that you're leaving, breaks my heart. Um, and I'd like to thank the board also, um, during this whole COVID mess, for keeping the schools open for no mask and none of these mandate stuff and keeping an eye on the critical race theory. I appreciate that. It's kind of my condensed version. Um, I took just a couple pictures. So that's okay for you guys to see. And thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Um, I did want to talk about this because this came out in the legislative session that's happening right now. Um, so some of these things that have been happening, I, I can't tell you how unusual some of the things that have been happening, you know, finance-wise from the state level, but with the COVID dollars and the ESSER dollars and all that, it really is not business as usual. Senate Bill 14040 passed, and that was for this school year, not for next, for this. And it gives a thousand dollars bonus for administrators, instructional people, service staff, so counselors or nurses, and classified staff, for pretty much all staff, except for like substitutes. And was signed into law on March 23rd. And so here, this is pretty much guidance that we got from the State Department of Education. So thousand dollars, you know, for those staff members. They also add the 19.59% of employer benefits, that's PERSI and uh, FICA, so Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, to cover those costs. The allocation is based on when we submitted our staffing data in September, because that's what our enrollment is. So they did use a formula to generate the dollars. In other words, if our staffing is a little bit different in February than it is in September, they're using the September snapshot. Um, these are actually federal funds from the governor, so they didn't go flow through the State Department of Education through the governor's office. So it's ARPA, State Fiscal Recovery. We have to pay before, some of other funds, we have to expend the funds and then ask for reimbursement. We have to draw these down no later than June 15th this year, otherwise we can't do it. Um, so, we have been working on this when this came out. Uh, the State Department asked us to pay the bonuses as quick as they could so they could deal with all of the grant claims that are going to be coming their way. Um, so you only have, we only have two payrolls. We have this payroll or May. So we've decided to put this on this April's payroll. And so we've been working on that as far as the back end of getting everybody there. And how we are paying is that if you're a full-time and we can, we're, we're calling full-time 30 hours or more because that's when we qualify for medical benefits. That, that's the thousand. If you're less than um, 30 hours a week, then we're paying 500. Because the state did fund on a partial FT basis. If you, were, if you were a partial FT, you did not get the full amount. So that's what we're doing. By doing that, we are going a little bit over our allocation, but not much, and we can cover it with other funds. So, but this is going across the state and just thought you should be aware that this was passed into law and of the short timeline that we were given. Finally, I know there, there was a question I think from Chair Thompson about the boundary exchange. So I reached out to Jeff Bowler, um, who, who I've been working with on this, and he uh, reached out to Tracy Bent with the State Board of Education just this week because he hadn't heard, we hadn't heard anything. She confirmed that we have they have everything they need to move forward, and she was saying that the next steps for them is at the state board level is to assign a hearing officer, and then they have a hearing for the state board. Um, and she, this is in process, but no timeline was given. Um, and I know that Coeur d'Alene had went through this process with Post Falls, the same process we did a few years ago. And, and it was just recollection that they, the state board at that one didn't have to have a hearing at their level. Yeah. But at least that's what uh, Tracy Bent is saying now. So it's really the balls in their court. So that's where we are. And um, I'm guessing that you know maybe it'll happen. I mean, they have this meeting this April, and then do they do quarterly meetings? They're having some special <coughs> special meetings. Special meeting. Okay. Um, so, given, I don't know, the state board's calendar and all that, but it, I'm sure it's going to be several more months. And I'm here for questions. That's all I have. I have a question. What presentation are you using? Because I can't find any of that on what I'm seeing. Oh, these, those two I added just to the group of slides. Oh, can you share that with the board so we can have it for the public? And then I want to know also sure. how are we going to report the breakdown of those funds received and how they were paid out to the public on the website? Well, on the website, they'd be attached to each employee as their gross pay. Yeah, you know, like we always report, or we had reported in the past on the COVID dollars as a lump sum, and here's where we're at, and here's what we spent, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm just 
curious. I wasn't fully aware of this, so I'd like a little bit more information on, um, you know, are we paying everybody that was here in September, being that the September numbers were used, and if they've left, then we, no. but we were paid based on September numbers. If part or of reimbursed, I guess, would be. Well, no, we're not reimbursed. Our, we were given a, a grant allocation based on our September FT numbers. Right. So then at that point, um, we would, so that, that sort of, think of it as a funding formula at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so that generated the dollar amount that we can use in this very specific way. Mm -hmm. So if you're not with us now, and you're not an employee, you're not gonna get the $1,000. Mm -hmm. If you are a current employee with 30 or more hours, then we're doing that and we're not, um, if they are hired, we, we said by March 1st. So we don't have, we haven't had a whole lot of employees since March 1st, but um, you know, but generally let's say you did come on in October, you're gonna get the, the full up. We're not trying to draw those lines. Sure, yeah. Um, but it is a reimbursement. I mean, you just stated that. Correct. Okay, so I guess what I would like to see is where were those numbers given to the state in September? What do those dollars amount to? And what are our numbers now and what's going to be paid out? Because I also heard you say um, about the uh, $500, which I think is very generous to do even if they don't technically qualify. But I would like to see a, a better... Well, they do qualify. I, I, if that. Well, and, and I can get you more information, Trustee okay. Grissom. The, the formula they use mm -hmm. is... This is sometimes the challenge we have with um, with sometimes as yeah. at the state level where legislation is passed or even how the funding formula or how they say how they communicate things out where they don't really understand how things really work in the nuts and bolts. Sure. So when the you know governor says that you know he gave a seven percent raise to classified staff, that's just not true. Mm -hmm. What they did is they gave a 7% raise to the base of the funding formula for salary-based apportionment. So salary-based apportionment gives a full-time FTE $23,000 a year, which is about $11 an hour. That's what we get funded. So they gave 7% on that 23,000. Mm -hmm. And it's also, they fund me 0.375 FTE for every funding unit I have. So we have more than double classified FTE than what they fund us for. Because yeah. it's just a formula. So a lot of times when the state says they've given this, that's not true. Right. So that's, I, that, I mean, that, I know, I that's why we have, so this is really sort of the same thing. So when they did, and- I just want it for transparency for the public. That's all I'm saying. I don't want to be months down the road and people are hollering and screaming like they were about the COVID money because they felt like we weren't being transparent about them showing them the money. So that's all, that's right. all I'm Right, and we can certainly, I mean, I can, I mean, it certainly will be, the payroll will be reported just like all right. payroll is every month. I mean, right. so that's, I don't know how more transparent it can be than that. Yeah. So would this it. be a line item? So when they go and look on the financials page of the website, would that be a, a line item that they can see? Or because typically the payroll is just rolled up into when you look on the website and the, and the reports that are posted, it's just rolled up or at the state level rolled up into a lump sum. There isn't a line item. Um, Correct. There would this would not know. and right and, yeah. and there, this would not be a, a line item. I don't right. know. Just because we have. We have many employees that are paid from multiple funding sources, but we just give what they're paid total. We don't yeah, disaggregate right. that they're paid with state literacy, federal Title I, federal special education, right, right, right. all yeah. those things. Yeah, I just thought being that this is another this year chunk, so to speak. Um, yeah, it certainly will be like when we do our audit mm -hmm. for this fiscal year, this will be a, under the federal dollars and its own grant. Mm -hmm. um, with, and the dollars will be reported in our financial statements for sure as, as a, an additional fund. Right. I'm, well, we're using one fund for this fund. It's called Fund 277, but that's where we've been putting 
um, where the state is directed to put several of these governor, like we had COVID relief dollars earlier from the right. governor, like right. last year, that's going in the same fund. So as we report in the financials, it's all sort of getting lumped in that one area. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. okay. Thank you. Um, the only question I had was uh, on the attendance or on the en enrollment attendance report. Um, in 11th grade, we apparently have uh, we have more students in attendance than we do have in enrollment. Well, that's probably my fault. Okay. I mean, as far as a typo. And I apologize for that, yeah, because I on the tenants I get a manual report and I type those in. Okay. I just thought that was interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, students really want to go to school. They don't even the, want to the state will the state will definitely yell at me if I because they're actually paying us for even more than aren't there. Mm -hmm. That's how our enrollment's up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is the safety, pres safety presentation by uh, Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Meyer. Uh, this is just the monthly safety update, um, fairly short. Uh, the biggest um, piece of information for this month is that in all three of our MRUs with Kootenai County, Rathdrum, and Spirit Lake, uh, there was language in there that I was to meet with um, the chiefs of police or the um, captain to review the MOUs to see if there any changes, uh, that if they have any changes they'd like to have made. All three agencies uh, said that they didn't have any changes. And so, um, to be able to uh, finalize the MOU for the fall. I have uh, linked the three MOUs here for you. And uh, if we could put uh, as an action item for May, um, your desire as far as if there's any language that you want changed in any of these, um, or just an approval from you to move forward for uh, fall of 23. So they are here for you to peruse at your leisure. Um, Kootenai County and Spirit Lake are, I believe, identical. And then remember, Raptor added that that little bit of language. So, okay. um, so it's a little bit different. And then um, the last update is that um, my plan is to post the position um, this in the middle of this month. And uh, Board Chair Thompson participated in the last round of armed guard interviews, but we would love to have a board member um, participate in that. And I'm hoping to have those uh, interviews scheduled for the beginning, the middle of June after school. Um, if we can do it at the end of May, that, it just gets a little bit crazy. So mm -hmm. for sure by the beginning of June, I want to have those interviews done. So, and that's the update for this month. Any questions? Is that an all-day interview process? Depends on how many applicants we have. I but I believe we were done the last time around two or three. Yeah, I don't think it's correct. Four. Four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long day. Yeah, it's a, it is an intensive interview process because um, we're putting somebody with a weapon in our schools and we have to be really sure that they're the right person. Um, so there are several committees the uh, kids actively participate, parents actively participate. Um, but it does, if we only have um, two high quality candidates, then obviously the, it goes faster. So it's really dependent on a number of candidates. And so the MOUs, you want an action item for approval on the May agenda? If that's possible. Okay, if we have um, suggestions for correction changes or whatnot, you want that in advance of May to get that how would you like to do it? Um, well, what is the expectation? I, I just, I would like to have the MOUs done prior to the close of school so that uh, mm -hmm. you have the ability to sign for the district and then I can ask the three, um, the two chiefs and the captain to sign for the agency so that we mm -hmm. have them finalized before um, summer. Okay. That would be my, my All right, ideal enough. situation. So, Rosanna, can you tell us what our next 
when the main board meeting is supposed to be. Sure. I'll turn my calendar thing on. And if there is, um, if there are changes that you would like to make, uh, then that that would give me opportunity to uh, work with that chief or the captain to make sure they're um, comfortable with those changes. Okay, so if we, sorry, you got myself out of work. I poke the calendar thing. Um, so for May, the meeting's the 11th, and you want approval then, 9th. So if we had any corrections or changes to you by Tuesday, May 3rd, would that be sufficient enough time? Yes. Okay. So do the board members think that they can, if they have input or changes, get them to her by May 3rd? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're still up there, Mrs. Oh, Arnold. Sorry. Oh, um, this is uh, no action needed. Just uh, I am seeking input tonight. So I brought to you a few months ago um, some applications for some new clubs. And, it, and because we used Google Form, the information got dumped into an Excel spreadsheet, which was really hard. Um, I felt it was really hard to really get a good picture of what was um, being asked. And so I worked with Chelsea Peden, our, our receptionist. And Dr. Meyer, if you could just click on one of the club applications for me. Um, she created a fillable PDF, uh, so this is what it would look like now when somebody fills it out. Uh, and so the plan of action moving forward is that I would provide this document to you uh, if we get um, a request for a new club. And then I would link it into that spreadsheet that's uh, attached in Boardbook with those dates um, of approval because the principal has to be okay with it and then the board gives ultimate approval. Right. Uh, so I'm just looking for a little bit of feedback to see if that meets the needs of the board. And then the title, that process for approval of student clubs, that's actually a <coughs> link to a document that outlines the process. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, this was much easier to, to follow. And my goal would be then we would have a running record of mm -hmm. the clubs that the board has approved. So would we have a separate sheet for each school or would we have a running of all schools? Well, I guess it says that one of the columns is the, the school, so you can you would see what school it's It's primarily, I anticipate that primarily it's just going to be Lakeland High School and Timberlake High School. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can certainly do a sheet for each school if that um, is what you want. So the middle schools have no clubs. Um, they not not very not very many student clubs. Do they any student clubs right now? No. Besides your Timberlake Middle School theater club that just got approved. Yeah. Typically, if we have clubs at the middle level, mm -hmm. it's a teacher directed club like a uh, homework club or some mm -hmm. kind. Of after school for offering that the teacher's providing rather than a student initiated. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the step by step mm -hmm. process. That was great. And I like the the sheet that you gave. And I'm just gonna forward using this until yeah. it doesn't that mean you're yeah. 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 I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is the pre-K program update from the Badger. Good evening, um, Board Chair Thompson, Board Members, and Dr. Meyer. Um, I just was here to give you an SWD update as well as pre-K and life skills. So currently we're at about 600 active students with 20 in referral, just meaning that we're started the process of parent consent, we're gonna start the process of testing, and determine if they were eligible by the end of the school year. We have 23 teachers, um, about the average caseload is about 30 per teacher. 
Um, currently, we have three school sites. The average eligibility report, because they don't have an actual caseload, um, but they do about roughly about 90 reports per year. Um, currently, we have five speech and language pathologists with an average caseload of 50. Each. Speech. E each. Each. Mm -hmm. Yes. So our preschool update is um, currently we have one teacher, one long-term sub. Um, our, one of our preschool teachers is out on medical um, leave, and so that's why the long-term sub is there. We have 29 active students and seven potential students in referral. Um, again, going through the referral process of um, being tested or getting consent for parents. I'm hopeful that next school year, we're going to have start the school year with 22 students, um, and that's with um, kindergartners moving on <coughs> and referral students still being on the caseload. Um, I would like to move forward to having kindergarten um, students that would transition into kindergarten um, attend four days a week. Currently, they're attending two days a week, and I would like to move forward with having peer models um, to create that. And so, moving forward, we're still going to try to keep the two teachers. Um, into the preschool program, so we'll have two different programs, two different teachers, be able to collaborate and be able to move from classroom to classroom with students. I'm a little confused on the two different programs. What is it that you're... Not different programs, but different classrooms, so they'll be able to like go back and forth between the two. So maybe in one they could be able to do just focus on centers and focus only on social development, okay. while maybe they'll pull another group and only working on just specific goals that they're working on for their IEP. Okay, so it's just it's still the preschool program, mm -hmm. but it's just sort of compartmentalized yeah. for, for training yeah. purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I thought we were we're running two different things. Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right now we have both of those because it is a long term sub. We have the teacher and the long term sub just in like isolated in that one classroom. Mm -hmm. Whereas I would like to open it up to be a little bit more um, room for them. So our life skills is growing, and so um, currently at um, our elementary life skills at Twin Lakes has a caseload of 14 um, students. Um, projected for next year, we're gonna try to still keep it around the 12 to 14. Um, unfortunately, we're, we weren't able to hire at Apple this year um, for life skills, um, but we do have a population of students been up receiving um, services up there similar to a life skills um, program, as well as some students in other elementary schools that we would like to have um, kind of model the same at Twin Lakes be also up at Athol. Um, and so we're projected to have about 12 students in that program as well. Um, our middle school um, currently has 18 um, on her caseload at Lakeland Middle School. Projected to sixth grade coming in, we're gonna be increasing. And so projected next year right now is about 30 students. Um, so we have um, requested to open up another position to have two teachers there um, to run the life skills at Lakeland Middle School. Does Timberlake not have any life skills? Timberlake does have. We bust them down. Unfortunately, Timberlake, um, there's no space to put the program up there that we okay. need. That is something I would like to move forward with, um, potentially maybe a new add addition or something, I'm not sure. But okay. So you'll be bringing that to us, or your desire to <laughs> fix I think that, that needs to be in a in a like a bond that needs to pass for yeah yeah. Um, but hopefully, I mean, we do have an increasing population of life skill students within the district, and so I would like to have a north and a south program as opposed to them just only being at Lakeland Middle School. Mm -hmm. I would also like to then branch out and be able to have it at Timberlake High School as well, as only right now it's at Lakeland High School. So within the preschool program, you said you want to add it peer models. Does that mean you don't have them currently? Correct. And with that, do, is, do we have the space for doing the, the two rooms? Mm -hmm. Is there space available to do the mm -hmm. two rooms? For yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to Mrs. That's Milton about that as well. Right. Um, currently, that room is being used by our preschool, but it's also being used as a sensory room. So sometimes they do take a couple of our students in there um, when their sensory um, processing is overloaded, and so the calming space. Um, but I would like to see it a little bit more as used as an actual classroom. Any further questions?
questions? Mm -hmm. oh, I, ha I have no questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do you have to stop that well, I just see that we're having all these, you know, greater needs and space and um, needs more staff, you know, to meet the needs of the right. students um, and to make sure that the teachers in these positions or the parents or whomever are dealing with this population of students are empowered with the resources that they need to do the job effectively. Right. You know, so when I hear all this and see all this, I just, um, I'm, I'm appreciative of, of uh, what uh, Ms. Badger's doing, and I know it's not an easy feat to overcome all this, but I just, I, I do have concerns with space and making sure that we can, you know, take her recommendation and meet meet those needs. But I don't like the idea, it bothers me that we're busing students out of their culture and climate to another culture and climate when they're already dealing with, you know, the, the life skills that, that, that um, but I think I probably knew that, but I don't, I didn't remember that. But, um, yeah, that would be my only concern. I don't like them. Moving. But I mean, if the room's not there, the room's not there, but we, I guess that's something that we need to keep on the list somewhere, you know, because yeah. I don't think it's, in my opinion, probably that much but very helpful for the students to be leaving. Oh, no, I would, you know, I agree. Kind of <laughs> vice versa, you know, any, either way. But anyways, those are, those are, I appreciate the update. Yes. So, um, that presentation was combined with the life skills, so we'll move on to the superintendent report. Okay. Speaking of space, Trustee Grissom, long range facility planning. So you will remember the board asked for long range facility planning signs up, uh, sign ups, and we have 50 parents as of Friday when we needed to have this information so to you. So this is how it breaks out. And just giving you information. We'll wait to see what the next step that the board would like to do. But we did have at least one parent from every, I thought it was great, from every school. Yeah. So good, great interest. I was really pleased with that. Are these all parents or are they community members as well as beyond just parents? Right now it's just parents. Um, we can run something. We have it on our website. And so um, we could eventually do something more if you want more community members. Rick, we could run an article in the B, uh, in the Quarterly Press. We could uh, send a postcard. I know it's a, it's, it's a on the website. Of, yeah. um, okay. So, what avenue we go about to get community members? Once the board, what we did last time that we found effective. Once the board determines, like let's start it in April or May or when the board wants to determine to start it, is we did talk to people in the community that had or had prior interest and they had agreed to come on. So we can also go out and talk to people in the community and, and solicit some community members as well. So that's really up to the board. So I wanted to give you an update on that. And then Dr. Tasley and I are going to um, just do a little update on the student-led conferences, which is, No, I was just uh, telling Trustee Bain that um, I do think there are some community members based on the comments that were left on the spreadsheet okay. that he linked into the yeah. board update. So they might, yeah, that, thank you, Board Chair Thompson, because they, so far we've only advertised it out through Skyler to all of our parents, but it has been on the website, so if somebody mm -hmm. implicitly went and intentionally went on the website as a community member and heard from somebody, mm -hmm. but we haven't done very much advertising out in the community about it unless they heard from somebody. Um, mm -hmm. So that could be. But we could do a better job of getting more community members if we have some other avenues to advertise it. So that would be up to if the board wants. I put it in the board update for the last couple weeks. Just like if you want a different avenue or you want to give us next steps, that's we're open to that right now. But I think it's a great start. So student-led conferences were in uh, March 10th. And it's uh, my favorite thing we do. 
And the reason why is we are not going to read this, but it, this is uh, available to the public and it looks kind of long winded, but it, what it really says in essence is the why of doing student led conferences is that the research shows that students who take responsibility and ownership for their own learning, and that comes with telling your parents, your teacher, your peers about you setting your goals, setting where you're going to move in the year, and then showing the progress, areas that you're proud of, areas that you're still working on. What this entire why says is that there is more growth and student learning when students take responsibility for their own learning. That's this why in a nutshell. It allows the kids to have ownership and autonomy of what they want to focus on and what they want to do. So, and this presents the avenue for them. So, it is a great day. Um, here's Hattie's effect size. So, at the very top, it really talks about teacher estimates of achievement. And then I can't see that far, but it is the student self assessment. The student self assessment, I could look right there, um, is third. And actually, I think this is now changed again. So, um, but uh, the importance of kids really having ownership and empowering themselves to focus on their goals and the areas that they want to achieve in, as well as recognize that if you haven't achieved it, you can still, you just continue to push forward. And so um, there's always room for growth. So what this really means when it says it has an effect size of 1.44, 0 0.40 means one year's of growth. So for a student to be in a classroom, 0 0.40 is an effect size, means that you're getting one year of growth. When you have students that are behind, or you want to have them gain more than one year of growth, so you can see these ones at the top have approximately three years worth of growth by having 1.44. So you're getting more bang for your buck uh, for these top ones in this list. So this just kind of shows you, shows teachers where to put some of their effort to. And increases engagement from the students. So this was our plan that we've shared with the board every year. Uh, we started uh, my first year in fall of 2017. Uh, my second year, we did a pilot. So I brought it to the district the first year and said uh, really what the research shows and how it's good for kids and asked for a pilot and Betty Kiefer, uh, Dr. Pasley was actually the principal there. They piloted it the first year and then you can see how we've added on every year. And this year we went up through 10th grade and next year, the P of A, is to do the full rollout, would be adding 11th grade. And so the SLCs, student-led conferences, will be K through 11, and seniors would do their uh, senior projects and present those. So it's a K through 12 um, <coughs> implementation plan for the district. Any questions about that? <coughs> Dr. Peace. So here's the attendance tracker. If you go and you can look at the uh, blue link um, and see every single uh, grade level and then per building. And so, but we just kind of averaged. So district attendance was 92, K5 94, 6 8 92, and 9 10 is 86. So over the course of the you know five years, four years that we've been doing this, five years for Betty Kiefer, um, I think elementary has always been above the 90s. Um, 6 8 consistently has been above the 90s. Last year, um, ninth grade was above the 90s. So we've had steady um, attendance historically from the start. So you can look on there if you want to see. And then just a couple highlights. There's sweet little kids from all the schools. Look at this cute one with the little girl. Um, and then this was uh, something they did at, at Betty Kiefer this year, like Why I Matter. And they um, have some videos uh, that I can share with you, but that Ms. Hostetler did that were pretty exciting. Uh, and parents really had a lot of positive feedback on that. Did anybody have a chance to attend student-led conferences this year? I saw you. That's <laughs> I was highlighting that there was a board member. <laughs> curious just real quick sure um do we still offer the traditional parent teacher conferences mm -hmm. how often is that so occurring? historically and lisa can tell me if i'm wrong my understanding is we always do it in um, november and we used to do an optional one third quarter if need be just based on um if for the students that were struggling 
Um, so we supplanted student-led conferences during kind of that third quarter one. Um, parents can always, part of the survey that they fill out is that they want to FaceTime with the teacher. They can have one in addition. So we're actually adding the, there's three if you want that. Um, parents can ask for it or a teacher can ask for it. Um, this is just an additional piece, but in the past it's only been a required one and then that third quarter one was optional or if teachers felt like they needed it. Is that accurate? So, so we're actually doing more, um, but letting the students have a voice in that process and really taking ownership of their own learning and the things that they want to accomplish throughout the year. So sometimes the goals are not academic. It's I want to be a motocross racer or I want to, you know, so then um, we're definitely building community through our student-led conferences through the lens of the whole child. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Moving on to unfinished business, we have the uh, board norms and protocols that we need to get that solidified. And I don't know what everyone's input is on that. Is it your intent that we discuss it right now and talk about what we want to add to that, or are you wanting to know how we want to attack that? I want to know like, how. Okay. I want to know how. Okay. Yeah, we don't need to go into some deep long discussion. Yeah, this. well, that's what, I was, <laughs> that's what I was worried about. So no, no, no. <laughs> how? Okay. I'll clarify. How do we want to attack these board norms and protocols? Anything? I think a, a workshop is would be most effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. For well, that process, I just I so know it's difficult to have yeah. more and more meetings, but I did. I, I, how do we, how do we, well, and maybe we just, each of us come to the workshop, intending for the workshop to be short, by bringing a list of things that we would like to add to those okay. norms and protocols, you know, just kind of okay. that little bit of homework ahead of time, and so we can have, that would be great. Yeah, that that would. That's fine. Okay. All right, so when we get down to discussion, maybe we can talk about and pick a date. <laughs> Um, next, we have the quick email and drive. Oh, right. There's a memo in here um, from clerk of the board. So I don't know, did this come from Rosanna or did it come from you, Janelle? It came from me. Okay. Um, a functional drive specific email has been established. I now have complete access to it as well as the clerk of documents drive. Um, so can you, what does that mean? So there was a um, discussion um, at the training that the initial clerk email was just an alias. And so the board's request was to have it be a fully functional email to receive and send and be a repository. So we were just reiterating to the board that it has been completed. Rosanna does have full access to it as well as an established clerk specific drive. So we were just completing the circle on the board's request. Okay. Uh, next item is the website board meeting videos. Um, Dane reached out via email. Um, and I don't really, I don't really understand all this. Um, Ramona. <laughs> Could you please educate? Yeah, and then we'll pass it to you. At least me. Oh, it's this was, I think, when we discussed, um, it, instead of when you go to the district's YouTube channel or even on the website, that's just <laughs> everything's thrown in one big bunch. Right, right. <clears throat> so his suggestion was in order to meet the desire to make it easy to find special meetings, regular meetings, workshops, to create playlists, so the playlists would be the segregation instead of being able to create a folder. Um, okay, so is what it is. So at least, and I don't, I don't know if we can do um, an indented structure, or not of also by year, but at least it would be a good beginning to not have or everything just thrown together. Yeah, and the same for the website. Okay. Because even the website list needs some type of indented structure because it's also the same running list of every 
thing we discussed. Okay. Um, so his suggestion, I think, is perfectly fine. Um, I think it's a it's awesome start. So I think he's done quite well so far with it. So we just let him do it. Yeah, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, just mm -hmm. let okay. him go ahead and move forward, and then we'll look at it and see if it makes it any easier when we're trying to go back and. You know, the conversation. Right, yeah. exactly. Right. That it's, you know, because I'm sure it's just as frustrating for other people trying to, um, in, the, in the naming convention, I noticed we've finally hit a um, <laughs> consistent <laughs> naming convention. <laughs> that's, that's a good name. <laughs> because even the naming convention was a little frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, of, I think it's looking much better, you know, as time goes on. I mean, you know, there again, this is all, you know, birthed out of COVID. Um, so I think as time went on, it's it's mm -hmm. it'll become more and more comprehensive. But I'm, I mean, I don't have any problem with his suggestion. No, I don't have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, good. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Or so Thompson, do you want mm -hmm. uh, me to follow through, or Rosanna? Follow um, I'll, I was going to say, I was just going to tell Rosanna, Perfect. just go ahead and follow up with Dane and let him know t to do what he's asked to do. And Perfect. We can clean that up and keep moving forward. Okay, um, moving on to the consent agenda. I do want to point out there was a little hiccup on the regular and special bills, so those were just um, the untitled update and the additional bills list was just put in right before the meeting. Um, nothing changed, I don't know if anybody noticed when you went through the utilities, the bills were infiltrated into there. So I just wanted that cleaned up. Um, and then the additional bills list had gotten into the utilities, so that just got pulled out and then uploaded into its own little dealio. Um, it is a technical okay. term. <laughs> okay, so um, does anybody uh, have any questions or uh, things on the minutes? I just have one general comment, <coughs> if I could. I, I still feel like the uh, minutes are much more voluminous than they need to be. I agree. And uh, so I think we need to work on paring that down. Uh, you know, people want to know what each and every board member said at any one moment. They can watch the YouTube video. Correct. And I, I have had some conversations with Rosanna about that. And um, she she did upload uh, the meetings from the, the minutes from the workshop, which I don't know if anybody had a chance to look over those. Um, I kind of went through and, and did some cleanup, but Rosanna stressed that she's more than willing to do what we want, and so I think just taking steps, understanding that you know, my conversation with her was any notes you want to take, however detailed they want to be, that's great but the minutes are just a short summarization and making sure that um, you're, you hit what the, what the trustees say because that is, <laughs> you know, our questions or whatever, that this is our meeting. So you have to be able to figure out what actually transpired in the meeting, but we don't need a verbatim uh, transcript of the meeting as the minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, we will be working on that, like, we will be. Well, I think a, a, a template is probably appropriate. So in, until this again is worked out, that you know, there's plenty of templates out there that show you know here's the agenda item, here's the action that was taken, here's the vote, who voted what, and any pertinent you know maybe start with. Um, I'm not sure if Workbook has the ability to set a template for um, the actual meeting minutes, but that might be mm -hmm. helpful also when. Uh, she's compiling them. Yes. Um, I would like to take the 323-22 minutes out of the consent agenda. Um, I would like to table those. The reason being is um, it doesn't reflect, the minutes do not reflect a correct voting. Um, there were several times when nothing, the, I know at least in the policies they were not passed unanimously. They were there was some uh, nays, <laughs> but that's not reflected in the minutes. So that needs to be reflected in the minutes. Um, so we'll have to pull those ones out. Um, but other than that, I didn't have any other qualms for. 
for the minutes. Didn't have any questions. Does anyone have any questions or comments on the HR report? Okay, or the resignations or the alternative authorization. Any questions on that? Okay. Any questions or comments on the regular special bills? I don't, I don't have anything specific, but once again, just a general comment. I, in my review of the bill list, indicates to me that we're spending money on some things that I, that I don't really understand necessarily. Okay. And, uh, but I think it goes more to prioritizing our purchasing and uh, what our budget process is, and maybe uh, in the budget report we'll get more information about how that's going to be approached. But okay. You know, I, I've mentioned before about the telephone thing, but there's right. others in there. That's I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions on the bills? Just one quick question, Dr. Mayer. When we pay someone to come in um, and they are, like, um, we paid uh, Chrissy Williams 2000 where is that coming out of when we're paying her? I mean, like, what, what pool of money? Um, if that was the training, I believe that was the training that she was doing. Okay. Then that would probably come from, I would assume we can ask CFO Wallace, but I assume that comes from our professional development fund number is that tax services yes and that's included in the general fund okay 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 so if there's no further questions on any of the consent items consent agenda items um with uh, having pulled out the 323 22 minutes um I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda um, inclusive of the tabling of the 323-22 minutes. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Moving on to new business, we have the curriculum, the supplemental resources uh, for board consideration. I would like to note that we did not have any parent feedback on any of these um, items. And I just want the public to know that I do greatly appreciate when they do provide feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very valuable and it, it helps us look at things through their eyes. Does anybody have any questions or comments on the supplemental <coughs> resources for board consideration curriculum? A couple of comments. Um, yeah. One is, given uh, the recent uh, information coming out about Disney product, yes. I su would suggest that we be very careful about selection of those materials. I noticed some had a Disney designation. Okay. There were a couple of them. I, I looked at several uh, from, uh, I think it's the Apple list, but mm -hmm. uh, a couple of them seemed like they were rather dark. Yeah. Their approach. <coughs> no, it's a, it's a twin X elementary list. Okay. And I do know, um, or at least it's been brought to my attention that like these books sometimes come from the schools doing their book fairs and so they acquire these books. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're just grateful for the resources, but I don't know how to, to help on, 
on that end with what you're saying, Bob, because I do understand, because sometimes I've looked at the books going, Ugh, <laughs> I don't know about that one, but, you know, I get it. Well, I, once again, these are library books. And mm -hmm. Correct, mm -hmm. so, correct. You know. Anything coming out of scholastics anymore is highly um, politically driven. Yes. Um, just the the, the um, change in their uh, mission mm -hmm. and um, the recent the last couple of years, the recent um, steps that they've taken to remove those that are not woke from their list and cause those to apologize who they felt were. Um, incorrect and then to remove authors who had been with them for years and go to um, those teaching specific critical race theory and other from a um, pre-k up um, so it, I mean I just you know it, it's going to be mingled in, in everything mm -hmm. um, and like you're saying I know a lot of them comes from the scholastics with their with their book fairs and right. all that. Um, so even Scholastics himself have taken that juncture um, and removing you know classical readers from their from their list also. So definitely something you have to watch for. Like Bob said, they have library books. So. Yeah, they are. Yeah. But some of them respecting that we're at a K through five, mm -hmm. some of them I'm just like, that's just too, too much at this grade level, from my opinion. But that's why I cherish what the parents have to say, because they're, mm -hmm. they're in there with, with the kids. So, um, I don't know, any other comments or concerns? Mm -hmm. Full approval of the list. Yeah. I move. All right, I'll second. Motion in a second, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Moving on to the LHS and THS valedictorian and salutatorian selections. Uh, does anybody have any comments, questions, inputs? No, I'm just happy when it's so hard to choose. They can mm -hmm. have six or eight or twelve of them, and they have to and they have. it down. <laughs> yeah, I'm very grateful. I think that, that's awesome. That, yeah, yeah, we did that. That is awesome. All right. That being said, I'll entertain a motion. There's no further discussion. I move to approve the LHS and THS valedictorian and salutatorian selection. Second. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Trustee Quinn. Do second. Having a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, moving on to the school proposals. Uh, first, we have the REACH Academy. Um, that was presented and tabled. Uh, We've had so many more of you. I think it was last month, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they were all last month. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was the first official meeting of last month. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, just recap, I'm Leslie Runyon, I'm the current principal of REACH Academy. So I wanted to do a little better job of kind of um, sharing a little bit with you and kind of giving you some recommendations on what I would I see as well as um, I've met with Dr. Pasley and Mrs. Arnold and Dr. Meyer, just to give you a little bit more to vote on <laughs> for the future. So I just created a, just a short presentation. I'm gonna go through a few things. Feel free to ask me questions along the way or we can wait to the end, it's up to you. Um, so this is kind of our path. So just so in case you don't know, we do um, have a mission and our mission at REACH Academy is to create intentional individual partnerships between students, family, school staff and community within an online hybrid option where all students can be successfully engaged in student-centered learning and individual needs are met through support of home-based education and caring in-person instruction and enrichment where students prepare for their ever-changing ever world. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes it is. <laughs> Woo. And when you're nervous, you kind of have a little tongue twist there. So as um, some of the things that we would like to move forward with, we would like to continue with our hardwood format, um, obviously following board-approved curriculum, pr 
project-based learning, um, as well as our mission states that we have a supportive home-based education, partnering with our community school focus will continue, smaller class sizes, and just that motivation of our staff. Those are just some cute pictures because the kids are always cute. <laughs> And who's getting silly string all over? Actually, right you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> so logistically, um, my my thought is if we this year we have found that we've lacked in some resources. So I would actually like to move to an elementary school building that would give us those resources that may have been limited, like a nurse, a library, a counselor, a good solid playground. Uh, we would just continue with our technology and um, the programming that you have supported us with. I would like to continue my education for my teachers for more um, project-based learning strategies so we can implement some of that a little bit stronger in the future. As well as now we're kind of free of a little bit of COVID um, scared them, scared them. See, I'm coming up with words myself. Um, so we would get into that community part of our mission with more partnerships and um, learning in field trip kind of based formats. So staffing wise, we kind of had a little discussion last time, so I wanted to kind of um, maybe clean it up just a little bit. So we would like to, um, after um, kind of consulting with the admin team, we're kind of seeing that we would like to go from grades two to six. So I'd like one teacher for grades two, three, one teacher for four, five, and a sixth grade teacher. I'd like to continue with my one paraprofessional that would allow for some interventions and support of the teacher um, and one admin assistant. Now, if we did move into a school building, an elementary school building, we could utilize the admin assistant from that school building, so that might be a position that wouldn't need to be filled. So I guess I should clarify just a little bit. So as we were looking at the options and some of the discussions we had the last time, we did leave off seventh and eighth grade because as some of your questions were, there are two definite different types of students that are seventh and eighth grade, and we have the independent learners, which we have IDLA for. And then we have students that need that really, um, probably more in-person uh, learning with some, some more support. So there could be another option for that type of child. So I, there was actually a line kind of drawn between those two types of students. So we have options, or we have the IDLA if they're the online type of learner. And then there could be another option for those seventh and eighth graders. So I just wanted to highlight some of our projects and some of the fun that we've had this year. Um, obviously, it's a little bit harder to do pictures of online kiddos, so um, these are our in-person days, which we do have a lot of fun on the in-person days because that's our, our really good family time. <coughs> so this is just a letter that one of my students um, had written just about why she felt, um, and she wrote to the board, why she felt REACH was a program that um, inspired her <coughs> and made her be successful. So do you not think that by moving into John Brown, <coughs> REACH will lose its identity? So that's a good question. I would not be able to answer that question. So um, just there is the philosophy of school within a school, and I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. where um, they have their own. I don't know if our building makes us who we are. I believe it's the staff and how they are led mm -hmm. makes them who they are in our community. Now, you're right, we probably would take on whatever elementary school we are in, some of their um, community, because mm -hmm. that would be part. But we're currently doing that now. My students were invited to attend um, Twin Lakes Book Fair because mm -hmm. we don't have space for a book fair, so we utilize that. We're actually going to Twin to do our spring pictures because partnering or trying to get a photographer to come three days in a week is impossible, mm -hmm. especially because employment, they don't have enough employees. So um, I couldn't actually answer that if um, that would be something that uh, 
if anybody has a crystal ball, we could look into it and find out. Here's my concern with it is that we're talking about um, a school that was started to meet a particular population mm -hmm. um, and now we're putting the population back into the very environment that the population did not do well in. So that was the point of them not being there and these students are only at reach one day a week, is that correct? The hybrid format, yes. Yeah. So they, for the second, third, one day, uh, whatever, it was yes. fourth, fifth, so it'd be and then three six. days, yeah. Yeah. So, so presently so we're days. running, I mean, our, I would say our start and stop time would be different than, so it really is just a room that mm -hmm. we would be utilizing and possibly um, allowed to go check out a book because that's one area we tried to partner with the Rathroom Library, just didn't work out this year, they couldn't commit. And so, they would not intermix with the kids in the building in my vision. Mm -hmm. It would just be utilizing their resources. Utilizing if we had an issue that we needed a counselor so that person was right on campus instead of having me call all the counselors and trying to find one that's available. And then they have to then pick a time to come see my kiddos. So, but yeah, I do see what you're saying. I, I'm envisioning it being we utilize it space mm -hmm. in their facility um, and then that allow us to have lunch and access to a lot of um, yeah it's really concerned because this is a student population that does not do good in the brick and mortar and we're putting them right back in the brick and mortar um i just i, I have a hard time <coughs> with the well they're in brick and mortar uh, but there's, different. right, yeah. exactly, they're, yeah. you know, they, they don't do good in that population for whatever reason. Um, I mean, if we're going to do that, I don't see the purpose of reach at all. Just put the students back in there and give them the resources. And that is, I mean, and that's why I wanted to present a different, uh, or kind of what the vision is to move forward. Right. And so it is obviously the board's decision on if, um, that is the best route, or if it's better to um, have the kids go back into the in-person buildings. But when you presented the last time, um, I took from it that um, there was obviously a staff issue because staff were, you know, a teacher was teaching three grade mm -hmm. ones, which was extremely difficult and should not have happened. Um, I took that and then the younger grades, um, K, one, two, um, a little challenged with the whole online presence. That that it wasn't it wasn't a good fit for that age <laughs> bracket. It was yes, it was the the smaller of our groups, and those of us who've been in education understand the dif the importance of that separation between the family the mom mm -hmm. and the children right. and then just the access to the hands-on learning is very important in my opinion mm -hmm. and mrs arnold would agree with me as well just being a younger student right. or younger teacher you were younger students you funny younger <laughs> teacher. right so that is one of the reasons why the shortened of the the grades mm -hmm. the grade bands um sixth grade so we did discuss the sixth grade um this may give parents an option where they still want a little bit more control of the of a child instead mm -hmm. of sending them to a middle school mm -hmm. scenario. And uh, we, we threw around lots of different ideas on those kind of things. We were just trying to make it the most realistic and the most cost effective. Well, if we gave the school back, I mean, I, I, we've taken off the seventh and eighth grade, which I think I mean, I don't, I don't know why. I know we're going to hear about an alternative middle school, but why have we taken off the seventh and eighth grade if they're not um, alternative classification? I mean, because I don't know that any of the seventh and eighth graders that were at Reach would have fallen into an alternative classification, would they have? Huh? 
And that's kind of what I said. It kind of is down the line between okay. kids that need a little bit more right. support, which an alternative education could be that support for them, or we have the kids that are just very independent and can do the right. online firm and which we have IDLA. So again, these are just suggestions. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. I just this is a different presentation and a different. Yeah, I was not prepared last time. That was not. You oh, know, I thought you were well prepared. Well, I mean that's just me speaking <laughs> off the cuff. So last time was what we currently have, which is an option as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's just there is different needs in our higher in our seventh and eighth grade than the current. Uh, ability that we have. A counselor mm -hmm. is a key for some of those 7th and 8th graders you, uh, that transitioning to being a human adult right. is different than our elementary <laughs> kids and so um, there's just some certain needs that I think would probably benefit from a different um, scenario. Um, it seems to me, you know, the fundamental question is whether or not we want to continue this mm -hmm. program to start with. Right. One of the things I think the program points out is uh, anytime you can approach one on one instruction, you are laid up on getting the job done. But mm -hmm. realistically, that's not possible, obviously, for 4,700 kids. So the question becomes how do you, how do you approach it uh, in a way that is potentially going to be most successful? One of the questions I have is uh, you, you provide some anecdotal, anecdotal comment about the success from one student, but do you have our data specific that shows what the progress has been for kids in this last year? So are we talking, what kind of data? Are you referring to well, academic data, yeah, social sure. emotional I'm data? Concerned. No, I'm, I'm most concerned about academic. Okay. Um, I do not have anything specific compared um, other than our district-wide data collection. Um, we're very comparable. Um, elementary, we are sitting um, we are sitting a little bit higher than the average when you're talking about our iReady data. Mm -hmm. uh, middle school, we are below, I will say, and um, that's because we've, we haven't had a consistent from the beginning of the year. As I mentioned before, our population changed through the year, so we don't have the, who started with us or not who are with us now. I mean, they're mm -hmm. still there, but we've added just a lot of middle schoolers and um, their success in the classroom. I wouldn't be able to tell you in, in Timberlake or in Lakeland, but since they've come to us, their scores are stellar because they just haven't developed that ability to learn independently and their parents lack that supervision for that middle school group. I think that last comment is very, very important. The fact that maybe all too often, although the intentions are good, the higher grade level you're working with, the more difficult it is for parents to do the job mm -hmm. of, of assisting. Uh, you know, they can be supportive in a lot of ways, but uh, you know, as the material gets more interesting as they climb through the grades, mm -hmm. it's a little tougher for parents to deal with. All of this running with what you just said, uh, this middle school students that came, I mean, if they were if they were down here and they still climbed up, that's still success. Oh, Even it's if success. they're not up to here with, I guess, general population or however we want to label it. Um, so can you confirm that? I mean, have they grown from where they were when they came in? Yes, okay. some, but there is still some that are struggling. Okay. But they're struggling with, their, they would be struggling in the brick and mortar building as right. well. And unfortunately, exactly. um, school systems, we're working on academics. Mm -hmm. And so we're really focusing on that. And um, But again, your comment is absolutely correct. We expect the kids to do their assessments at home. And if their parents say their kids can't even log in, and we kind of know that they probably can, because kids are very tech savvy, um, then that's an issue that we can't deal with on an online system. And that's why the middle school, in my view, is very difficult to have it be online for kids that are struggling. If you were to continue the program, did you, are you given any 
thought to increasing the amount of time that the kids spend with you? So, uh, you mean in person? Yes. So we have, it's very interesting because I did do a parent survey um, just to try to see what the view is. It's again, very, some parents want a little bit more in person and some parents want a little bit less in person. So um, there isn't like a consensus one way or the other on how, and so what we've tried to do um, is any in-person day we video, we have a live feed. So then if the child can't attend, then they have that option of attending online, medical reasons mostly. You, uh, you brought up the topic of social and emotional growth. What, would you like to speak to that? What progress has been made there? Well, if you notice the young lady's um, letter, she talked about some issues that were happening in prior schools. Uh, that's just a student's viewpoint, so I'm not going to say that happened or not happened. And so um, when kids like that, for example, we had one Tuesday who basically was getting Fs in, in um, seventh grade. And she was so proud to tell me on Tuesday that she has all A's for, for this last quarter. And the one thing is she does some racing and so she was missing a lot of school um, when she was in the brick and mortar. And so my program allowed her to still compete in those races that she does, but also an option to do her work at her either those off days that she's not racing or her own pace. So. Um, that's a thing I have noticed is there's been those kind of success stories. Compiling the data, I have not done that. So there are some other districts that are starting this program, so I, there is would be options if that was something that, um, you know, if a family really wanted to take part in, they could move to a different, you know, kind of request just as well as we did this year. We allowed Coeur d'Alene Post Falls students to come to our district to access this, um, but they are starting the, their programs this next year, so they could access a program out in another district. So did your staff, uh, specifically the teachers, have any uh, professional development in the online arena for this year? So we did, they did, uh, before I came, they did attend um, some Google teacher training this last summer. Um, okay. And so they had, act, so they basically were taught how to do the platform that we're using. Okay. And so this year, um, their prior administrator did not uh, fully implement the, the um, Hattie's research, um, visible learning. So we stepped back and mm -hmm. we focused on that for our year just to meet all of those. Um, you know, the district kind of meshing with the district so we could actually be part of the okay. overall district team. Right. Um, so they're all certified in Google and, um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. <laughs> yeah, and Microsoft as well. So, um, and they had to compile. So a lot of, after they did their training this summer, they did <coughs> compile, um, to be integrated, one of our goals this year was to be to do more integration. Obviously, because when you're online, you don't want to be online for six hours right. in a day. So we had to shorten their period of time that they're together. So we worked heavily on integration with our science and social studies and math and um, ELA. And so they had time this last summer to create some lessons and and design more integration. I did um, present or. Uh, let Dr. Meyer and Dr. Pasley see some of the classes that I would like them to take this summer okay. to enhance um, that project-based learning okay. that happened, you know, that it's offered, everything's offered online now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they can take part in that to develop uh, how to utilize our district's curriculum 
and right. mesh it to more of a project-based learning. So they're hitting the standards, but also doing it in a way that kids really don't know they're doing it. Right, right, okay. Is, is most of your focus uh, academic subjects? Uh, how much how much time uh, do you devote to music or PE or other other programs of that nature? That's a good question. So electives. Um, so in our elementary, we do um, science. Uh, the four subject areas: science, social studies, math, and reading or ELA. And then they have what's considered kind of like an elective class. So we do not have PE or music that are additional. They are, they, their parents sign, have them do activities and then we sign off. A lot of our incentive programs have been based around like physical fitness kinds of things because we know that's one of our areas that we cannot provide. Oh, and, and in the middle school, we have elective classes. So we have a yearbook. Um, so I have a set of kids that are creating our school yearbook. Um, we do have music. One my, my intermediate teacher also was a music teacher. So she's brought in her keyboards. And so she has some kids that choose that as an elective. So they stay after our typical in-person day and work on some of those electives. Are we going to make a decision on whether or not the program goes forward? Is that what we're doing this evening? We do need to decide if that's what we're going to do. I was just going to let her sit down instead of stay up there and stare at us. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chair Thompson, before she sits down, I would just like to. Yeah, well, I didn't want to interrupt, but I do want to acknowledge. Um, when she was hired and we went through the interview process, one thing that the team did appreciate ab about um, what she said was, she had a vision for some of the things she's presented tonight. She's done a really good job of not of going into a program that was already set and kind of like we had talked about, the airplane was kind of in flight. And she's done an amazing, Dr. Pasley and I were just talking to her a couple weeks ago. She's done an amazing job of really starting to put the wings on and the tail and the seats and the, you know, getting it. She's been a great pilot. And it wasn't easy because it, there's conflicting, you know, similar to what Tristy Grissom said, there's s conflicting needs coming. She has done an amazing job of really molding this to try to help. I think you heard from the parent last time. Um, they've just been so appreciative of her energy that she gives to it has really what's helped this program be sustainable. And I do want to acknowledge that this vision that she has, um, I think is a great vision myself educationally. I think it's good for kids. I think parents will appreciate it. I think you're also then using the best resources that the district has. So you're being fiscally responsible, but you're still trying to meet the needs of kids and parents. And so I just want to acknowledge you publicly for all of your work and everything you've done up to this point. So thank you yeah, thank for your work. You. So, um, me personally, before I would want to even entertain anything on Reach Academy, because I am a little concerned about removing the 7th and 8th grade uh, component from it. Um, I know that we have an alternative middle school presentation coming up after. So I think maybe we should see that presentation and then we can talk about both of them collectively and figure out some sort of plan of action. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Good evening again. Um, Mrs. Runyon did an amazing job talking about uh, a way to fill a niche that we definitely have within our community. And the board has been really supportive of trying to be very customer friendly and customer driven. Um, so this is just one more 
piece to that puzzle, not in place of, but in addition to. Um, so one of the things, uh, as Mrs. Runyon and Dr. Pasley and I were talking and brainstorming, uh, that we know about middle school kids, and it's, a, it's just a small population within the, that middle school, but we have kids who are really kinesthetic, hands-on learners, and a t traditional brick and mortar school doesn't play to those strengths all the time. And I sometimes feel like we have these really cute little square pegs that we're trying to fit into a round hole that, and it doesn't always work for kids. And so what we are trying to accomplish is um, how, do we, how do we meet the needs of some of those kids who really struggle with um, being able to organize themselves. And so one of the things when we talk about what could this alternative um, to, a, to a, a traditional comprehensive middle school look like. So I guess the first thing I wanna just start with is when I talk about alternative, in my mind, alternative is not a negative term. It's, it just means that it's, it's a different option, right? Um, at, at the state level in statute, they're, they're, it's defined and how you identify kids and how you fund it for kids. But in my mind, it's, it's, they're, they're the same kid. They just sometimes need a different path is what we're looking at. So. We talked about a middle school academy instead of calling it an alternative school. Uh, and some of the things that we talked about that we think would meet the needs of some of our middle school kids would be um, kind of uh, modeling after uh, Mountain Views, um, some of the things that have been really successful for them. So one of the things when I talk to the Mountain View high school students about what works for you at Mountain View, um, I hear two things. One is it's so much easier to focus on just three classes at a time. Um, they still get their 12 credits over the course of the year, but they do three per quarter instead of six per semester. So they, don't, they can focus on three classes at a time. Uh, for some kids, that's just a lot easier. And then the other thing is because the, the community is smaller, they feel like the teachers get to know them really well, that they have an identity within that school, and there's a sense of family. And that's, that's the number one thing that Mountain View students will tell you is uh, we feel like a family here. Um, and so we are looking at ways to provide that um, kind of a setting for our, some of our middle school kids who um, struggle with that uh, bigger school population. So uh, you can see on the right side of the slide, um, we would be able to provide smaller class sizes. We would focus on some of those organizational skills, the executive functioning. Um, we would be uh, participating with Mountain View and some of the mastery-based learning uh, as they have a grant. And then also um, to mirror what Mrs. Runyon is doing with REACH is um, to continue that idea of project-based learning. And then uh, one of the things that has proven this year to be really powerful at Mountain View is the Moose Connections. Um, and that sense of community building and identifying your passions and passion pro projects and those kinds of things. So um, when Mrs. Runyon and uh, Dr. Pasley and I were talking about uh, the two programs um, and really trying to decide what to do with the seventh and eighth graders, the conversation that we had was um, if, we, if we were able to offer both, would we still have a large number of seventh and eighth grade students who would want, who have, are successful in REACH and want to partici continue to participate in REACH. Um, that, eight, that grade band, seventh and eighth, tends to be the most challenging right now for REACH because um, of the parent component and just, I you know, not able to help as much as they are able to help the third and fourth graders. And also dealing a little bit with some just uh, motivation and putting, wanting to put in the time. And so, um, so we wanted to be able to offer both. But what we weren't sure about was if we offered this, um, would we have enough seventh and eighth grade students in reach to actually have a class? And so um, that's when we started talking about, well, we do have the option of IDLA. Um, and so students who are really highly motivated uh, at that level would do really well in an IDLA class. And it's um, taught by a certified teacher. Um, so we do have options, I guess, um, that I just want to make sure that you recognize. Uh, when I was speaking with Trustee Grissom about this, 
Um, she had asked, uh, how would we identify students? So on the left side of the slide, you'll see just some of the statutory information. So there's a the State Department template for the documentation form, and then the last link is the Mountain View took the template and just put it on their letterhead and made it their own. But then you can, I also have Idaho Code 331001, subsection three, which speaks to alternative school, and then IDAPA 08020310. So those are links are there for you to look at. Um, some of the logistics, so when we, uh, the three of us chatted, and Mrs. Runyon had talked about her desire to be in an elementary school with, with REACH so that she had access to some of those resources she spoke to you about. That opened, if, that, if the board made that decision, that would open that building and it would be ideal for the academy to be on the same campus as the, um, the high school uh, because we would have access to the counselor there and then um, Mr. Uh, Uzi and his PA, Mark Gordon, are also on campus to, to help out should we need um, administrative assistance. Uh, based on alternative school funding, which is a, a 12 to 1 um, ratio for alternative students rather than, Dr. Meyer, what is it for traditional middle school? 18. So um, with a <coughs> smaller ratio, we could generate um, funding for a teacher. Uh, the busing is already taken care of because we're already busing our Lakeland High School and Timberlake High School students to Mountain View and the middle school kids are already riding those buses so they could just continue the, the ride to Mountain View. Um, we would use our current process for identifying who those students would be. We will use our currently adopted curriculum and, and um, we're not talking about new students so it's not a need to buy new things, it's just making sure that we move those resources with the kids and then um, we, sh we believe we have ample furniture um, at facilities to be able to um, outfit the, the classroom. So at this point, um, there's really not a, a financial um, impact to the district to um, operate <coughs> the program. And then I will stand for any questions. Um, the, uh, these students would t attend as so is, the, is it an online uh, curriculum or schooling like um, it's all five days, five days a week, week. In, in the classroom yes. setting? Yes, in a really small group setting um, which with a lot of individualized attention. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and for, we try, we actually, um, a few years ago, probably four years ago, um, we piloted a school within a school model at Lakeland Middle School. Um, and some of what we learned was when the kiddos were in the classroom with the teacher, they were very comfortable, felt very safe, and, and um, there was some success there. But the way that it was kind of designed was they could then attend other classes within the building. And so what got hard for them was, well, when I'm in my classroom, this classroom with my teacher, this is how we function and these are the rules, but then when I go into just a, you know, the typical classroom, things were different and it was uh, hard for kids to make those transitions. So when, uh, and Mrs. Murphy and Mr. McDougall and Mr. Minty are here, if you have question, excuse me, questions of them. Um, but when we talked, uh, Mrs. Murphy in particular, because it was at Lakeland Middle School, felt really strongly that this program would be, would do better um, in its own environment and not a, a school within a school kind of setting. So, um, but it would be five days a week. <coughs> Have you done any projections as to what the enrollment might come up to for next year? Uh, we are anticipating, can you guys help me out with that? What do you? Um, to get the, there was that 12 to 1 ratio that we were really trying to hit for staffing and we felt comfortable between both schools that we would be able to hit at least that if not surpass that with current students at REACH um, who really are more of that alternative type kiddo but went there for something different so we felt pretty confident that we could hit those numbers um, close to 24. We were actually uh, slightly worried that we would be over yeah over the 24. Uh, that would be the max that we would want to put in that right. space with two teachers at that point. 
um, because we both of the principals um, ha have shared that they, in addition to their students who are at REACH, who struggled in that brick and mortar comprehensive middle school model, they still have some kids in that model because it doesn't work for parents to have them online at REACH who are really struggling. And so in addition to some kids who might come over from REACH, we do have some students who are identified in the school who might benefit. And we actually every year have um, middle school parents who meet with Mrs. Murphy and Mr. McDougall asking, what do I have to do to make sure that my child goes to Mountain View and not to Timberlake or not to Lakeland? Mm -hmm. So this, um, it, this provides um, some relief for some of those parents. In the selection criteria, um, as whomever, administrators, teachers, whomever is involved in that and making the checkbox selections, um, and then it's decided that the student, you know, fits this model or the, these criteria is laid out in the statute. Um, how is the decision made? I mean, does the student or the parent have any say in whether they retain? I mean, what if they say, no, I don't want to do that? It's a team decision. So the principal, the parent, the, the student um, uh, come together and talk about what's the best placement. What does this child need? It's really individualized. <laughs> and if, um, if the parents and the students and the principal are all on the same page and feel like this is a, a great fit and we move forward. If it's presented and the parents are really, that's not the direction that they wanna go, then we just keep working with the parent to try to figure out how to make the current situation work for them. But we definitely do not forcefully put anybody mm -hmm. um, in a different location. Um, how are the, I guess potentially the 14 seventh graders um, that would roll into eighth grade at this middle school academy, how are they going to qualify for it? As far as the standards for at risk youth, if by what I'm hearing from their performance within the school, I mean, how are they going to meet these qualifications? They have to have at least three of them. On one side of the checklist, on the other side, it's just one. And, and uh, on the right-hand side, um, any kind of emotional um, issues for kiddos, that that's the only box you have to check on that side. So it's either three on the left-hand side or one checkbox on the right-hand side. And for middle school, that's typically how because credits are, uh, you can't be behind in credits for graduation at the middle level. Um, it, it is typically any kind of a social, uh, emotional type of a, an issue that the kiddos are struggling with that allows us to provide that type of individualized instruction for them. Okay. And it's only been within the last two or three years, I think, that the legislator, legislature has appropriated funding for middle level alternative school students. Um, but prior to that, it was just ninth through 12th grade. But they're, they're recognizing at the state level that we have some kids who um, thrive in a, in a different environment where there's just uh, more individualized attention from the teacher um, more hands-on, uh, project-based type learning, and less read the you know read the book and be a little bit more independent. So, is there um, have there been any studies done or data to support? doing elementary at a school within a school, but not middle school within a school within a school? Because I hear, you know, we've got one proposal, we're basically taking the elementary that is of its own little island over here and putting it back into a school for resource benefits, but then we're going to take a middle school out of the middle school and put it on its own little island because we think it would thrive better there. 
So I guess I, I don't understand how, other than the age level, that I get. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't, I guess I don't see the benefit of that. Um, if there's nothing to support that, if it's just a thought that we think it's going to do better this way, I mean, do we have any evidence to support it? Only this? the evidence, only what we have tried in the past and, okay. and the reasons that it didn't work. Okay. Um, they also then benefit from, for example, um, Mountain View High School students are moving forward with the greenhouse that the board heard about uh, earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. And um, so some of, they will have access to be able to partner with some of the high school students um, for some uh, mentoring and getting to work in some of those aspects um, mm -hmm. on that campus that they wouldn't have those opportunities if they were uh, at Lakeland Middle School or Timberlake Middle School. And if we did a school within a school, kind of, it would have to be at Lakeland Middle School. We don't have, as you heard earlier, we don't have any room at Timberlake Middle School. Um, but it, it, that, that just proved to be really challenging when we did it before. Okay. Do we have room at Mountain View? If, there, if the whole thing is to use all the Mountain View's resources and the partnership and all that, is there room at Mountain View to put the seventh and eighth grade there? Every classroom space is, and actually, every classroom is being used, and Mr. Gordon is teaching on the cart at Mountain View. And the students, the seventh and eighth graders, was it both seventh and eighth grade this year that participated in reach or just seventh? Seventh and eighth. So seventh and eighth this year that participated or the last however many years it's been now for reach. Um, they were doing the same rotation one day a week at reach and the rest online. So do you have an idea of um, how many of these students collectively between this proposed, you know, through this, if we did the second through eighth grade, do we have any idea of how many of those students need um, other resource help, the other, you know, I don't know, SLPs, if other sites, other, you know, I don't know if there's outside sources coming in, I mean, do we know what that looks like? Okay, so you're talking about our current kiddos that yep, we have. Yep. Um, well, we utilize uh, the the build the the special or the SWD teachers mm -hmm. and SLPs that are currently in uh, Lakeland Middle School, John Brown, Timberlake, and so mm -hmm. we do a lot of it um, over Google Meets. Sure. So let me, I'm, I'm going to count for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, currently, we have six. Six. <coughs> Seven. Mm -hmm. I just got a new one. <laughs> For receiving ancillary services? Yes. Uh, is it out of 77? Yes. So seven out of 77, correct. And that has been, I will say that that might, that is when we talk to parents, we do really partner, like with mm -hmm. Mrs. Murphy says, I have a student that I really, you know, is struggling with the peer interaction part of middle school, but academically is strong. Then we really do partner with parents to try to figure out is reach the right place. I mean, first they have to have internet, that's kind of key. Mm -hmm. um, but we really have a good questioning kind of session with them. And so if a student has some pretty strong needs, we do really talk to Mrs. Badger to find out, is it really the right spot to, to um, have that parent have that responsibility all day long, doing whatever is needed as well as the academics? And it just depends on the kid. So it really is individualized in every child that we have, which they would have, I mean, we do, it's just a team kind of event, so. A lot of emails back and forth between the middle school principals and myself. How many of those seven are receiving speech therapy? Um, just one. Now. We had a few more, but they have moved. It's funny, this year has been a transition year of kids moving. I mean, they're moving out of state. They're moving different areas. So we actually only currently have one. I, I may be missing something. It seems to me it to be extraordinarily difficult to do speech therapy over Google. 
Well, I'm not a speech pathologist, and I would probably agree with you, um, uh, but that would be kind of tough. <laughs> But we learned a lot from COVID, I will say. These ladies are pretty amazing. If you actually did any outside services, um, counseling, speech, OT, they do it all over Google Meets or, or obviously Zoom. I know, that's not. <laughs> of the younger generation, that's such a familiarity mm -hmm. with them. That is their world. It is more comfortable. You know, it's yeah. more of their comfort zone. Though. Oh. I, I would like to say I don't think either of us would be disappointed if we ha ended up having enough 7th and 8th graders in both programs. This isn't, for us, this is not a competition. It's really about trying to be as customer uh, driven as we can be. One of the things that has concerned me about um, some of our 7th and 8th grade students who are on reach uh, is the fact that we, we had one teacher teaching all three middle level groups, right? And by doing that, then she was only able to be online with her kids for a very limited number of hours per day. And I just don't know how you can get through all of your sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math standards mm -hmm. and have mastery of those in that kind of um, environment for kids who are not highly motivated. Now, for kids who are highly motivated, you can get a little bit of instruction and they can be independent with iReady and they can do what they need to do to learn. But not all middle level students are highly motivated on their own. It takes a little bit of maturation for that part of them to come out and that we usually start to see that when they get into high school. So, so that for me, that's part of this drive uh, for me is to, to try to provide, there is definitely a need. And so the intent for us tonight was just to provide options to the board to consider about how we best meet those needs. Knowing our population, and mm -hmm. that was our good conversation after our last board meeting when that was mentioned and we actually hadn't, she, Lisa had been working on it, but I wasn't involved and then I started thinking about my own kids at REACH and then I realized, you know, after we met with the middle school principals that um, there is a, a line between the kids that really need that support and um, those that are very independent. Well, respectfully, when you have one teacher teaching 39 students, three different grade levels mm -hmm. online, um, that's, to me, that's just not acceptable. It should have never gotten to that point and never been that way. Um, so I don't necessarily know that I can say it's all on the kids, that they're just not either mature enough or not you know, intuitive enough to know what they need to do when they're stuck in that position. No, I, so yes, I agree that that was not an ideal learning. No. <coughs> I, I will remind the board that, we, that the teachers did um, design how they wanted it to be, so they were given that opportunity. And they felt at the time that that was what was best for students, but um, in hindsight, again, they might have done it differently, but at the time, that's what they did choose. They thought that that would be the best way to serve kids from K and again, we our population did swell in that right. upper grades that we did not predict. And when you have trying to ask a kindergarten teacher to then all of a sudden teach middle school halfway through the year, is that the best scenario? Again, if I had a right. crystal ball, I could answer that question, mm -hmm. but I don't. So, So have you consulted with any of the other school districts in Idaho that already have these programs? There's some down south, I know there's a lot of parents in our area where their students are enrolled down south. I can't remember the name uh, The of online the school? Or is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes. Online. What's that? <laughs> Oneida. Mm, it doesn't, it might be, but it doesn't sound familiar. I don't think that was it. I was just wondering if you could. So no, I haven't, that. we haven't ventured out on Fort, uh, Yes, fortunately, people have ventured to us, sure. um, but we have not ventured out to see the different, again, this is, I'm not even in my first full year yet, so right. uh, <laughs> I'm just putting my toes in. Yeah. Right, well, I'm just thinking since we have such this proposed transition and how we're going to do this, and there's already districts within the state that have been doing it for years, it's nothing new to the public school system, and it's not... Uh, ELA, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they have, uh, what, what school district did you think they were? Or what Richard, Richard McKenna. Richard McKenna. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. 
part of that. That's not a public one. The, uh, the previous board member that students was in, it was the Oneida, and they give you money and then you sign up and it's all online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there was recently another district that was in the news for not a good reason for um, inflating the online numbers. We don't, Yeah. we're not in that boat. Right. So everything's been ethical and. I mean, you can, if you Google search, there's lots of them out there, um, right. just because there is parents, I mean, and we've been pretty honest with any parent that we talk to, just to making sure that we're the option that suits them best, or is this, or IDLA is the better option. They're a little restrictive on their entry and exit date, mm -hmm. we're kind of a free-flowing, right. uh, especially if they're from one of our Lakeland schools, because it's easy to accept. And right. So. You, you did mention that we have some students this year from outside the district. Mm -hmm. How many? Uh, at this point, six now. They have okay, a so few have gotten into some charter schools, and so they have left us. Oh, they've all left? Except for six. Oh, six. Yes. So do you anticipate all those six will be gone going into next year? Um, I did, like I said, I did a parent survey, and um, Seventy-five percent selected that they were would be returning. Yeah, charter school. And they're in the seventy-one that you projected. Uh, for next year, I don't know if I did a projection for next year, well, but is there? Uh, this says seventy-one students. That the financial end of things is. Based oh, for next, yeah, because we have seventy-seven currently. Yeah. So when you think about class numbers, we would have to stay within for the two three. We'd have to stay within the twenty three limit, and you know for um, for our, the teachers, and then the twenty six for the four five, and then thirty for the sixth grade. So that's is what would be our cap, I would say. Okay, so that's not actually a projection. I don't know what you're looking at, but uh, it, it could was, be. It's seventy one students times it equals three and a half units in terms of. Projecting the okay. revenue. Yeah, I'm not on that side of the. <laughs> that's his job. That's all right. We'll throw over the brand. <laughs> that's Brian's job back there. Board Chair Thompson, it was charter schools. The original and K twelve, and they have a K through twelve program yeah. and a high school program, and they were charter. Yeah, schools. and they have K twelve. There's several, but they're charter they're schools, not mm -hmm. private, but charter schools. And Oneida is a public. public. Traditional public aid program. So that's the difference. There are options for parents in, you know, there's some co ops and things like that in our area. So there are options that um, come. These are just some options that we are presenting to you. Okay. Do you have any other questions for either speaker? Um, I'm not not for these two. No, I have one final question. For Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we had the split so you could get in there. As always, everything comes down to you know whether or not we can afford it or how long, where the money comes from, and so on and so forth. This projection sheet was written by someone. Uh, have you looked at it? Yeah, he did. I'll get it up there. On the, yeah, that was really rough earlier. That was on the this is what that was doing. reach yes yeah so yeah I, oh go ahead i was just gonna say you're, you're ready to stick by that well i gave the caveat when i sent the email <laughs> with this is that this is one way to look at the numbers that really the best way to look at the numbers if you really want to say is this costing us more is you have to say if we had this program um, well, if we did not have this program, would we still keep those students and they would be absorbed into the main uh, program? And that'd be one. And then what would be the difference in our staffing if they were absorbed? So if effectively we had this program, kept the same exact staffing, the same exact students, really it's a push, right? If we were able to absorb those 78 students, and not have all the reach staff and, and reduce FTE and still serve their students, then by absorbing there, it's a, from just a pure fiscal perspective, it's, it's a win. 
if we didn't have the program and those 78 students left, then it could be, you know, so it, you, that's, I guess, what I was trying to say. Okay. So the best way to really look at it, I mean, I can look at these type of numbers and say you have X amount of students, X amount of staff as a base cost and not going further into utilities and shared costs. And yeah, I stand by those numbers, but that's real. the question is how many staff you still keep if you put the programs, because we're not, we still, those teachers have a continuing contract. So they, you know, we're sort of growing. I'm sure they're afraid to find a space. And then, you know, would some families look for other alternatives outside the Lakeland schools. Yeah. Have you looked at the uh, proposal for the seventh and eighth graders, money-wise? No. If they were, you know, classified for middle school alternative, though, and and we're able to get attendance at a 12 to 1 ratio as opposed to the, uh, you know, 18 or 20 to 1. Yeah. then it you know there is that enhanced funding so right. certainly it at, at a level like that it'd probably be pretty supportable thank you you're welcome okay so we'll open it up for our discussion <laughs> if we need to have further discussion on this The cost analysis for REACH is only if REACH stays at the building or if REACH continues, period. Is that the, those proposed numbers? There it is. Anybody have that answer? The, the, I think the proposed number was saying if they were in a building then the admin assistant, they could use existing ad, one of the existing admin assistants in the building, so that would save that piece of the funding that he uh, that CFO Wallace yeah. had put up there, but the admin assistant piece. I would think also if it's no longer in the building, then that building budget, or at least a portion of it, would be removed. Because if it's a school within a school, I mean, how how do we still need 86 hundred dollars allocated for a building budget for a building that they're not in I mean that's allocated for yeah, that probably the more to supply yeah issues. So yeah that's, I don't know. Know. yeah, yeah that's, build, that's just sort of my term for I call it the building budget but that's really the per student allocation we're given to the schools like for Exco Marcos okay. and whiteboards to do yeah. their flashbacks so the, I guess if those <laughs> students at some point would be if they did go to John Brown, then the dollars would sort of follow to John Brown. Okay, like the four, the instructional funds that you see on the yeah. other instructional funds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the hot spots, uh, although... Well, Some families check those out uh, to go home. Uh, because Mrs. Dunbar? Because Rumbaugh? they don't have any. Dunbar, <laughs> Runyon, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, are the hot spots, do they check them out to go home or is that for the building? Yes, those are checked out by students who don't have internet access but have cell phone access at their homes. So that's our the district's way to provide them that access. So that those yeah. would still be needed. Okay. And those are turned in every year and then checked back out to the new students. So I don't I don't know the costs like over time, but I'm assuming that's a, the subscription to the access. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with knowing the crowding that we have, although I looked at the numbers and they're fairly low for the lower grades. Um, you know, putting more students into a building that's already mm -hmm. vying for space um, for those that are there. Um, and I understand we utilize every corner we can. Um, and you know, there again, if we look at the purpose of REACH, and while I appreciate wanting the ability to carry out the mission and do all that, but if we look at the purpose of REACH, it was really created to get us through the COVID 
years. Remember, I mean, the, the enrollment or the attendance was over 400 at one point. Correct. Right? Um, and now we went from 400, so I remember looking at it, it was a school's worth, um, down to the 77, and come next year, who knows where the, you know, those students will be. Um, I guess we really need to ask the question, although I know we have needs for this population of students within the district, um, you know, do we really, do we meet the need of the student or do we keep, you know, create another school and put a school within a school for this population that grew, or, or the school that was created to meet the, the need during COVID? Um, you know, I know, I know it's a, a tough decision, but. Um, well, the original premise for the program is done by the wayside, basically. Correct. So it's now a question of whether or not it's important to try to service those students in a way that's different from the normal school mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether or not everything else kind of makes sense logistically and financially and right. so on and so forth. Right. And, you know, my, my feeling at this point, unless you're ready to get a motion on the table, uh, is that um, you know, the middle school, school thing makes some sense, partly because I heard from the middle school principals that they would not have difficulty in identifying st students to go into that program that would come up to the level that we would expect in terms of the numbers in the classroom and the teachers that we would have to have. The other one seems to be a little bit nebulous to me at this point in time. They haven't really projected what that enrollment might look like. And I'm concerned about hiring two or three teachers and maybe not having enough kids to justify that. I, I just don't know where we are with that, that part of it. Well, in all fairness, I don't know that we'll know in, until we know, so to speak. Um, okay. The way REACH was brought to the board um, it's just frustrating to me that we give it one year and then we think that it's now by the wayside. It was brought to the board with extreme passion. There had been publication in the newspaper. There had been advertisement on the media. And so it was brought to the board. It was brought to the public before it was brought to the board. And I do see the value in it. I do see it serving a a smaller population, but it's definitely larger than the alternative school will be. So the alternative middle school. So I, I personally think that REACH has barely even gotten off the ground and we want to redo it and you know make it something different, which you know it, it sounds like uh, Dunbar Runyon, <laughs> Mrs. Dunbar Runyon, <laughs> she has definitely a vision and a passion and that, I mean, she didn't start the year out in that position, she acquired the position due to a whole bunch of, or she earned the position, she applied for it, etc. But I mean, she didn't start out the year as, this is your job. Um, so she picked up the ball and ran with it and I do agree that she's done a phenomenal job and I personally think I personally think she deserves uh, the opportunity to do more with what she is given. Um, I'm impressed by the eighth grade letter. I find it interesting that it was an eighth grade student and we're looking at getting rid of seventh and eighth grade. Um, or at least that's kind of the proposal. I just, I, I think REACH can develop into something more and I think it should have the opportunity to do that. I don't think it should just be um, kiboshed within one year. I, I, that's, but that's my personal opinion. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to get a more concrete feel for how things are going to operate and right. whether or not we have a full handle on it. To be sure, uh, those kids who are in that program you know, have some special needs that, uh, you know, that need to be addressed in some form or another. Uh, my recollection is from the first presentation that we were we were already moving in the direction of eliminating seventh and eighth graders out of that program. Maybe I didn't hear that correctly, but that was the impression that I got. Uh, and, and at the same time, there was this 
suggestion that maybe we would have a different program from them. It, it, what, what I'm hearing is that the folks in the REACH program struggle to deal with that population, partly because it's a, a currently three grade population. The teacher's trying to teach all the subjects to three different grade levels at the same time, which is yeah. an untenable position for, Correct. for the teacher. And so finding an alternative to that makes some sense, and the alternative that's being proposed, I think, also makes some sense. You know, I, I'll just throw it out uh, in preparation for motion. I would, I would be willing to go along with taking both programs into next year on a pilot basis. As presented. Okay, so you want to take the REACH program that's been in existence for a year and now make it a pilot program because it's going to be within a school? Well, because of the fact or that, that, it's been changed. So that, okay. that the recommended changes includes you know, not having the lower grade levels, not having upper grade levels, focusing on the center grade levels, which really makes some sense, I think, from an instructional standpoint in working with kids uh, that, that may experience the kind of needs that these, these folks normally see. And then moving to the other program, which, again, based on my prior experience, uh, certainly has a, a workable uh, solution for seventh and eighth graders. But see, I think the district can do a better job of meeting REACH's needs um, if left in its current location by working out the resources that it does need. Because um, I, don't, I don't know what we did this year that, I, obviously the needs were not met, but I don't know what, you know, it sounds like we tried to go to the Rathdrum Library, um, but I don't know what why we didn't meet the need for a counselor, why we didn't meet the need for a nurse. I don't know why we couldn't have worked that in in some fashion. I, I have no idea why, but I do think that we could do a better job at meeting those needs. I personally think REACH needs to stay where it's at and continue to grow. What well, would well, 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 we do the seventh and eighth graders? I think the seventh and eighth graders should stay. Well, and based on that theme that it was pointed out from the last presentation, you know, it's kind of down the middle. You've got those that do and you've got those that don't. My concern is, is your take, you took a teacher, you gave them 39 students in an online platform with one day instruction. I just think it may have been too much on both ends of the spectrum. I think if we make it reasonable and workable and functionable, maybe those kids would thrive. I don't know. And maybe I'm just being more idealistic than I should be. Who knows? Well, there's no way to measure it when they, they didn't have the resources to proficiently meet the need of the school and the student. So to even try and measure that is tainted data anyways. Um, there was nothing concrete about it. It lost its admin. Mm -hmm. um, it lost other things. Um, it, it, it already, it, last year was a transition from the 400 COVID students to this year's students. So I know I can't personally make a decision and say, oh, well, you know, last year was just a total fail. We need to, you know, not total fail, but my strong words. We need to move these lower grades here, get rid of these lower grades, take seventh, eighth, put them over here. And I, I, I understand the presentation, but I would think that we also leave it where it's at, give them the resources that they need, you know, that were already presented. Um, and see where it goes from, from that year. Um, if the seventh and eighth graders are going to uh, spend more time, I know that Mrs. Arnold said that they um, 
would go from being there one day a week to five days a week. Um, maybe there needs to be a little bit more um, planning with Mountain View if they want to, you know, become part of some of the activities at that school, then they do the one day a week that they're at REACH and then whatever they're participating, the greenhouse, the, um, uh, I just went blank, the, the other activities that were, um, you know, maybe that's something that, that uh, but I think that we should, and I know that there were other staff, um, I mean, now that we know the lack thereof, let's fix the lack and see if it works. If it doesn't work, then come back and say, that's just not working. Or the students didn't come, or, or, or what have you. Um, and as time goes on and people become more aware of it, it might change too. And there again, moving all these students into our elementary schools are always already so full um, and busy, and all of these things. Um, I think maybe a little bit more coordination now that we know. Um, those issues. I, don't know. I will point out to the board that they there is space at John Brown Elementary. Um, that's why they picked that school. There's several open rooms, so they're not busting at the seams at John Brown. I also would recommend to the board, and I've said this before, but my recommendation as a superintendent is that we take the educational experts' opinions. They have worked on this for months. And I think what they presented with passion and dedication, they have already thought through several of the things that you have brought up. And this is what the educational experts feel is best for kids. And my recommendation is that we take the recommendation from the two people that presented that they've spent months preparing and that this is what's best for kids in this community. And that's my recommendation. Well, I appreciate that, Dr. Meyer, but every year the recommendation changes from the experts. And it's a moving target. We went from 400 students during COVID, multiple grade levels, to remember when we started this year, I think we were only at like 56 students and now we went to 77. So I appreciate that and I do know that they spent the time and we're trying to meet a need. But from the board's perspective, I don't think anybody's saying anything about them not spending the time or the dedication. Um, but once again, we're being asked to make another decision on reach and it is, you know, it, it does keep changing and morphing. Um, that's why I, I also posed a question. Well, of, the public well, education. I, I, I that's what it's to characterize it more as refining. Yes, thank yeah. you. As thank time you. goes along, Trust you make the necessary adjustments yes. to refine the program, is the way I see it. Right, right. So, well, you know, Metamorph is the same thing, I mean, refining, whatever. It's becoming an, a new butterfly as time goes on. Um, depending upon the population and the needs of the students or the school district or, or what have you. Um, so that was, that was my, and, and then again looking at it as, you know, it did come out of COVID and, you know, do we just go back into regular school and leave the program that, Well, we do have a motion on the table. On the floor, yeah. whatever the case. Right. There's a motion out there. I'll second Bob's motion. Hearing a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Those, any opposed? Nay. Yeah. So, <laughs> what was the motion, Bob? Well, the motion <laughs> was to continue both programs in the next year per the recommendations that we've heard this evening. As pilot programs each, and we'll revisit it next year. And mm -hmm. if we need to refine it, we'll do that. Okay. Yeah. Three, four, two Thank against. Uh, motion passes. Next up is the bus bid. We are. We have been brought forward another um, bus bid uh, for two special needs bus about two special needs buses. Um, and it looks like the plan is to use ESSER funds to purchase the special needs buses. Um, 
for $220,000. Do we have any questions, comments, or discussions on this? Mm -hmm. So these are two on top of the other two that we already. These are additional, right? Yes. Yes, Trustee okay. Grissom. Yeah, after having we had a little bit of increase in our sped population, and so the two mechanics went to their director and said we really could use two more as their way it could happen. So we we talked to bring to board that. We could use ESSER funds for it. Um, we might have some bus depreciation there, but for sure we could use ESSER funds if we got approval from the state, and that would be, we'd go through that process. Um, so that, you know, we're sort of, with the mechanic request, we, we thought if we had the resources to do it, I mean, they, they wouldn't be ready by September for sure. I mean, if we went through this process, if we got them by February, we'd probably be lucky, honestly. So it, it would be a next year. It would hit the books next year. Um, will there be a caveat in the bidding that you can't change the price? I'm looking at, um, you know, that we can definitely put in a, a bid bond okay. and things like that. So if they backed out, they'd be charged like ten thousand okay. um, dollars. You know, again, we can certainly you know have that type of a language. I'm going to check with Corona and make sure their language is good, and then that would be the we could enforce that if they backed out after their bid. Okay. Um, we still wouldn't get the buses, you know, if they did that. Fair enough. Obviously, but, but right. No, we, yeah. need to, we need to uh, cure those folks of trying to take advantage right. of the situation. Yeah. And I, I don't know whether you check with legal counsel about language to make sure it's covered that way or not. Yeah, I looked at. Uh, some of the RFPs from Coeur d'Alene saw their bid bond language and add that and added that and I know that was um, uh, Lions O'Dowd had had sort of worked on that years ago. So I mean I can ask Megan to to review it and if she thinks it's good if you want to because I know it's language that they've used in the past but I haven't personally spoke with her. Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. I'd to have legal counsel we need to like review the language and confirm that it's still sufficient okay. and meets the statutory yeah, that's, needs. That's fine. Okay. Um, and will this be uh, will these be replacing buses or will they just be going into our fleet? No, they'd be replacing some really aged buses that are on last legs. Special needs buses? Or yeah, just buses? well maybe one, yeah. Um, okay. well definitely they we did put in a I think in the in the bid to you know if they would what would their traded value be? Yeah. Um, what whether it be one of our special needs buses or one of our oldest uh, regular ed buses would be determined. It's easier to get rid of them, so you don't have to you know, go to auction or public yeah. surplus. Yeah. yeah. In, in usually, you get they've been giving us three, four thousand a bus, which is more than we'd probably get at auction. Any further questions? I move approval. Yeah. I'll second that. Having a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Um, moving on to the new development donation. Um, we have uh, a developer that is donating $16,500. Um, based on 500 per diem of $500 per lot. Um, I believe we do need to designate where we want these funds to go. I believe we have an account or a, a, a fund for future land acquisition or building. Correct. <laughs> okay. So um, just to give background, this happened this developer um i think it's course of development they actually approached us before we were writing the letters with the dollar amount mm -hmm. um, because they've obviously been in the process with trying to get the approval from the city of raptor for you know this development for a while and so when they um anyway they did a approach us and, and they have gotten approval of city raptor and this, i mean this is happening um, but since it's such a unique uh, 
you know, donation, and really the first time we received any type of dollars like this from mm -hmm. a, a new development, we thought it was definitely appropriate to bring to the board so you can see. So to sort of make it more formal, if you, you know, scroll down, there is a, a formal resolution um, with some language, and um, this is what you would be approving would be this resolution. Mm -hmm. um, again, if, with the resolution, you need to have a roll call vote. And uh, and the resolution does say that we would be, and, and this sort of formalizes the board's intent, that we would be dedicating the dollars to just you know, set it aside for future facility needs or land acquisition, um, unless a, few, a, a board in the future change that intent. This is how you, you know, keep those those dollars. So it would go to improve, expand, or repair facilities or acquire land. Correct. So I was saying that it's sort of in that where we've put those other dollars from land sales um, when we sold the land out in Hauser for $150,000 or so. That's sort of set aside right now and same with Spirit Lake. So this would go into that. Okay. that those dollars would not really be spent unless, uh, you know, approved by the board saying, you know, maybe we do have 10 acres at some point to acquire that this could help with defer that cost or, you know, often, you know, in states where there truly is impact fees, they use some of these dollars sometimes, like if they end up having to put another modular building in, the, you know, these fees, you know, go to defer some of those costs. Okay. Or, you know, any needs like that usually. Gotcha. All right. Any further questions or discussion? A little bit, if I may. Uh, the developer offered this without any solicitation from us, I'm assuming. They, <coughs> they offered, um, we didn't come up uh, to them, they actually offered it and they, um, you know, asked that at least we would not oppose, you know, the development, the development and, and have a, so when our agency comments came out that we would, you know, say that we've, you know, they're trying to mitigate the impact of the development and work with the district to be a good community member. So, yeah, they did come up, and that was, um, that was actually the second developer that had a, had approached us. I, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate any landowner who's planning on developing land stepping forward and making some kind of an offer to assist the school district. My concern is that we're a little bit all over the map in terms of the dollar amount, and, and I think we need to get a, a hold on that. And I'm going to go back to what I suggested at some point in the past, and that is that we develop appropriate formulas to determine what our costs really are so that the developer can look at that and say, yeah, I can handle that, or no, I can't. But uh, it, it does concern me that, you know, we get an offer of $500 from this person, but we get an offer of thousand dollars from some other person and it's inconsistent in that regard so in fairness to the developer as well as to the school district I think we need to have a more structured approach to it I guess what I'm suggesting that's a discussion for another day we're going to some kind of lying out on the table no and I hear what you're saying Bob the disadvantage that we're at is you can't ask for a donation and say by the way I'd like you to donate thirty or forty thousand dollars or I mean, even if it just went down to $8,000 per head, um, we can't ask for a donation with a specific dollar amount. Um, no, but what you can do is... is we can show them what it costs. Uh, show what yes. our projected costs are. We had to build a building today. Mm -hmm. It's going to be X number of dollars per student for mm -hmm. a junior high school building or X number of dollars per student for an elementary school. And show the developer this and so that they understand right. the you know, what those happening. issues are. Right. They can make their offer then after that, but I right. think we need to make that as a... And I think that's that's a great um, suggestion that we do that. We do that. Um, I know that we were using a, a letter that we finally had legal right. look through and redraft. Right. Um, so at least we're in line there. 
made some but, progress. Yes, yes, we did. But I, I do think that there, that's good wisdom to go forward with, you know, letting the developer know your impact of 33 homes. If there's one student per home at 8,000 per head, is $240,000. And oh, by the way, it costs X million dollars to build a school. How would you like to help? Yeah. I mean, I have no problem sitting at. See, the, the, the way this is happening, they made the offer with the understanding that we would not stand in the way of the development. Correct. It's so kind of a... Bride in that yeah, sense. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. But, you know, anyway, I'm in favor. We'll, we'll entertain a motion then. I move to approve as presented. Resolution. Um, we're going to approve it or adopt it. Or adopt it. Sorry. No a second. We're hearing a motion and a second. We need a roll call vote. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Trustee Cree. Yes. Trustee Bain. Yes. Chairman Thompson. Yes. Vice Chairman Grissom. Yes. Trustee Jones. Yes. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. And they um, did ask. They knew this was coming up. That. Um, if the board would be comfortable having some public relations about this. I mean, I think they wanted to present a check of a donation and things like that. Okay. <laughs> Further the board. <laughs> Just let you know what the conversation was. Gotcha. So I said I would mention it if I had a chance. You know, I love it, especially if they added a couple zeros. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Okay, maybe I would just assume that they would do that. I would maybe add a couple zeros. Well, <laughs> not that, but the public relations piece. I mean, that's just I think a give and comfort. Yeah, yeah. Okay, moving on to the teacher research project um, we've been presented with. Um, I did go through and look at all the you know, stuff. Um, does anyone have any comments or concerns on this? Okay, well. You know, it, it sounds like a, 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 an interesting and kind of great project in a lot of ways. I have extreme heartburn over the questions that they ask of the student on their, what do they call it, exit ticket form. There's I three different. I looked at the two purposes positions. that are listed for, this, for the study. The, the questions they ask do not relate to the purpose at all. They're asking questions about individual demographics of the student, you know, what what race they are, whether male or female or non-gender. They're, they're asking that gender identity. Out, and yeah. I just don't Read think this. that's appropriate way to go. I missed this. You might want to take a look at that part. Of it. Yeah, I missed that part. Okay, if you, if you populate up this. Yeah, I got that. But I, I remember looking through it earlier and did not see that. Okay, well, it, it's easier on the. Oh, wait, no, I'm looking at the letter from uh, Jennifer. Do you have that up? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. All of these hyperlinks, the last bottom three, are the exit tickets, which are actual mm -hmm. surveys asked, that the kids uh, have to do. How did it make you feel? How is it? Oh. Uh, and that's the, the gender of the student, uh, race and ethnicity of the student. I'm not even sure it's legal to ask that. What language they speak. It so does say, it. does today's science lesson make me feel? So that is specific to the topic at hand. Um, Go ahead. May I just say something? <laughs> um, I, the intent of the of the course that the teacher's taking is uh, with the new standards that they, they have really moved from reading about science to actually doing science. So she's taking a course that's teaching her strategies to make this learning a little bit more hands-on. And the information she's getting from the students is, it, does this help you learn better than than the way we did it before is kind of what that's looking at. Um, if we're concerned about the, the students having to put demographic information on there, um, I can let the teacher know that and she can confer with her professor to say, 
we're comfortable, and the kids get to choose whether they're going to participate, as do the parents, um, in those exit surveys. So if 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 the university is okay with removing the demographics and just asking the questions related to the instruction, um, would you be more comfortable with that? Oh yes. Or even denoting those questions as optional, maybe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem with that is, is that students never feel like they have the ability to say no and leave it at that. A lot of times they have then, you know, well, why? Tell me why. Let's talk about it. When they say no, it should be honored then no. Mm -hmm. My concern is that they'll feel the pressure to do it anyways if the parent agrees to it. Um, yeah, and the, I do have a problem too with the how did you feel. I understand a portion of why they're um, collecting the data, but to ask somebody how they felt about something, I mean, what is the point of the interpretation? Why, why collect the data? So the, it's for the teacher, it's not for the professor. But the, those exit tickets are for the teacher to determine whether the way that the science lesson is presented is working better for kids than what the traditional I know but that doesn't answer that that though it, in my brain that question how did it make you feel doesn't answer that question so the year right. saying we could reword it so that you get the oh yes oh, it's, <laughs> it's like it's like with our generic question are you satisfied with the district you yeah. know well, what does that mean right. satisfied with what the you know the board the teachers the students the superintendent I mean it's not definitive enough, um, and I think it leaves a lot to interpretation. I notice we ask a lot of those questions at the elementary level for other things too, and that does bother me because how you feel about something is, you know, I feel sick because, you know, cereal ate had too much sugar in it this morning or whatever, but. You know, the, f the first uh, few answers to that question aren't so bad, but when it comes down to you, it made me feel happy, sad, afraid, or angry. Mm -hmm. I don't see the point of that at all. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Everlin has new information he'd like to share with you. <laughs> I didn't come dressed for this, but I'm here. Uh, board, the school board, uh, I was able to talk with Ms. Woodstrom to get some clarification because I read through some of those same things. Mm -hmm. um, and she said that this is a survey, she's part of a consortium about the new generation science standards. Um, these are questions from the university. Um, and so I asked her, how important is this to you? And she said, I'm just trying to help um, gain data. And um, it would be for the earth science students. And of course, it's uh, uh, parent permission has to be given. Um, so she just wanted me to share that. that mm -hmm. These are not her questions. She's part of this trying to gather information. So. Um, but the, yeah. may I, can I clarify that? Mm -hmm. The um, participation in this action research doesn't, the non-participation doesn't preclude her from participating in the class. That's correct, I got clarification. So she will still be able to be part of the class even if the students don't participate. So that's an important piece. Well, and something that is, uh, I guess, interesting with regard to these surveys is what it did say in the literature and in the video um, is, the student's name is being taken off of everything. I mean, you put it on, but then you take it off. But here, it, it does say, if requested by the teacher. So my thought is, no names at all, ever. They can just say what they say, and you know, it'll be as accurate as it can be to some extent. Well, and she just wanted to relay whatever you decide we're, we support and yeah. we'll move on, so. If you take the last questions off of it, I'm okay with it. But. The last I question.
So, Mr. Eberlin, um, if we if we throw it out there and uh, the motion to approve this does not pass, it's not going to affect her ability in this class, or does she need to? Chairman Thompson, it does not. I okay. mean, I want to make sure because. I have questions too. Okay. I was just going through the procedure to give it to you guys. I respect that. Thank and you. And so um, she said she supports whatever you decide. Okay. And it won't impact her. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. With that being said, do we need further discussion? at this time. Um, I would move that we um, approve the research project, but not the exit interviews. Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? I second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, we have a bleacher quote update. school bleacher clothes are from two different companies. Um, the, the first company, uh, Vibe Tech, they gave us two quotes. One was a quote adding an additional row. Um, right now there's eight rows at Timberlake High School on each side, and so this was adding a ninth row, but the rows would be a little closer together. Instead of 24 inches, they're 22, <coughs> so knees might be in the back a little bit. The reason for that was to add more seating capacity since these um, bleachers, you know, have the, the stairs, you lose some seats. <clears throat> also, then the second quote was just having the eight rows and the bigger space, adding a row does add dollars. The third quote from Montana School Equipment um, was just doing the eight rows. And also, that vendor, when uh, they got the specifications for them as far as cost, they recommended that the bleachers only go 78 feet because the undercarriage comes from the factory in 26 foot sections. Mm -hmm. And so, if you go to 84, you're doing a partial and it adds to the cost. So, um, he said, if I was going to do that, that's how I'd recommend it to to be more economical, but of course that impacts seating capacity. The seating capacities I gave were what the vendor said, so, you know, 824 compared to seating capacity, the other one where they have, it's longer, is 826. I don't know how they estimate that, if they think people are skinnier, or I don't know. Do um, we know I, what the capacity is now? No, um, the, Mr. Eberlin says 1,200 seats in our, but that how many? But you can you fit twelve hundred in your current bleachers? No, I don't know how accurate those are. See, I know I I was just trying to I just gave what they they put on the quote. Um, yeah, I mean twelve hundred would be a lot in that gym. <laughs> the difference is um, we don't have any walking aisles right now, so you just. So those are the, anyway, those are the costs. And I also put in, I, I asked after we received the quotes, what would be the timeline of the project? Um, and the Vibe Tech, they said they think they could make this summer. I, I actually, if they could, I'd, I'd be amazed, but you know, I guess that's what they say, and they can. <laughs> um, the other Montana uh, school equipment said that if he put it in right now, that it wouldn't, they're not gonna even 
I mean, installation would be March of next year. That it's a you'd have to get designed, put that in, and six months out of the factory to go. So, how Vibetech is working with their factories, I'm sure it's a different brand. I don't know, but anyway, that was the information I just had. And then there's Lakeland High School bleachers, and that's just for the uh, um, for the auxiliary gym the old gym and you know it includes an optional tear out we either we do the tear out or um, all the quotes have that or or if the vendor did and then there is also some electrical that's required we went and had an uh, electrician do it if they if you were going to put in the automatic bleachers which um, actually both vendors recommended that if it gets above four rows they really recommended the automatic because they said if you manually pull them out and over time if you don't pull them out exactly even it 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 can cause damage over time so anyway that's all the information um, from the two vendors I had the tear out um, optional tear out I mean if we did it ourselves we would still incur some costs I would imagine with um, dumpsters and all those <laughs> types of things, hauling it off. And Correct. I mean, obviously, yeah. if we are using our labor and, and maintenance did this instead of that, then as far as dollars, it's just the labor right. of that day. I, I didn't ask Mike to go estimate the, right. uh, yeah, the dump fees. But yeah, you're, you're correct. There would be some cost there. Yeah. For uh, <coughs> Lakeland High School, is that only one side of that tool? Yeah. Yeah. It, but it's super long, I think. I don't know. Yeah. It's like 95 feet, but the bleachers on both sides. No, not anymore. They took out the old ones on the other side because okay. they have bat, they have uh, locker rooms right there <coughs> on that side of the gym. That storage room. Okay. How about, uh, let's see, the junior high? The junior high included both sides and also a little uh, um, one bank 55 feet by five, one bank 88 feet by five, so there's the two sides, and then they have a bank on the opposite of the stage, yeah. so that yeah. four row, so it's all those. Right. <coughs> so it's all Correct. Okay. I, I, uh, Board Chair Thompson, I do want to say that I did meet with Mrs. Murphy, the Lakeland Middle School principal, and she said this was probably, um, if the board was interested in her thoughts on priorities, it was about 12th down on the list. She said number 12. She does have some higher needs that she would rather utilize, um, and probably not the appropriate time, but I just wanted you to know that in case you wanted to check with her at a different time, for, as far as bleachers. Appreciate that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't see any, any discount if we did three schools with a particular vendor. I mean, they're all pretty independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they bid them independently yeah. and gave the quote. Yeah, and they weren't, okay. they didn't say, well, if you give us these two, we'll give you a 10% discount. Yeah, they didn't come through. Okay. I mean, they certainly could have sure. offered. Sure, okay. Yeah. Final question, uh, a significant amount of money, uh, we do need to go through a bid process for that amount of money? For uh, public works under um, $200,000, you can go through informal bidding, informal. We don't have to do formal bids because they've raised the dollar amounts over time. 200000 is the trigger. Correct, yeah, it used to be fifty, then they raised it 100 now it's 200 yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we contacted a third, but never got a quote. So we're looking at these independently then, because if we if we if we approve purchase of bleachers for Timberlake and the high school, that exceeds the two hundred thousand. Right. I. I did it independently. So one's one day and the other one's the next day? Or that's what you did that? Right. <laughs> independent projects. 
Okay, Bleacher fans, what are we going to do? I know there is a significant concern about the Bleachers of Timberlake. Um, I said final question, but I do have one more answer. No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't say. You can cut off Bob. Or right. hit me okay. with it. Bring it. Let's go. Where does the money come from? I think this would, you know, either have to come from, you know, dollars that are already there in the plant facility fund, and you know, it'd be maybe defer other projects that you might do in the future. Or, you know, as you've seen in the budget report, with the general fund balance is definitely um, going to be in the black this year. So it could also just come from effectively fund balance. Okay. And if it rolls into next year, how does that work? Next fiscal year. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, definitely the cost would hit us next fiscal year. It won't be done by July. So. <coughs> I mean, the dollars are are there. If we dedicated them to either one, we just make sure that we have those resources. We're appropriate this year, but then we get actually spent until next year. Correct. You'd approve this, and then I, I would put it in as we're building budget now and into budget either, you know, with the plant fund or maybe we can do a combination or 100000 from one. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, but you'd see it on budget coming up. since he brought the bleachers from, um, you know, the issue from the high school over there. <coughs> um, or I'm sorry, this would be... This one might be... In the market. So Timberlake needs quicker than... Lake Tim Lake. Yeah, Timberlake okay. needs them bad. And okay. Lakelands are in the old gym, which mm -hmm. doesn't get used as much, but... They're pretty bad. I mean, how old are they, Bob? Pretty old. 79. There you go. 79. Yep. So the last time I stepped on them, I thought I was going through. Mm -hmm. I'm dainty. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> difference between the Vibe Tech quotes one and two, mm -hmm. um, respecting that you would be gaining two inches by quote two, um, we would be losing seating capacity. Um, and actually, if you do a, a seat count, um, per the bid, it's actually actually cheaper to go with quote one uh, per seat. Cost per seat is cheaper than quote two. Um, the Montana school equipment is, you know, obviously the complete cheapest, but if you look at the difference between the seat cost per seat from Montana to um, quote number one, you're talking uh, less than $50 for units, and that's per seat cost. And you're looking at $32.67 difference per seat. Plus they're in faster too. Yeah, no, I definitely want to go Absolutely. to the faster ones. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but I find it interesting that between quote one and two, I mean, you get less seats on quote two, but it's actually costing more per seat than quote one. Because they're 24 inch spacing instead mm -hmm. of 22 inch spacing. Right, yeah. Has the gym ever maxed out? Has the gym ever been maxed out? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, right. regularly. Okay. <laughs> Smelly. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> Mr. Evelyn, would you like to weigh in on this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the board, <coughs> board chair and trustees, this is my fifth year at Timberlake as an administrator, and this is the biggest topic on facilities. Uh, today we had students asking, you know, about the bleachers, and there's a lot of days that we can't push them back in. Mm -hmm. Um, which does impact our PE classes and even if they want to have a weekend volleyball tournament or basketball tournament sometimes we're like we can't get the bleachers in uh, we pull kids out of class constantly to get them in and out um, and then of course just overall safety I realize this is a lot of money mm -hmm. and so I'm up here in front of you asking for a lot I do think that the high school and spirit our high school youth is used probably more than any facility I can think of in Northern Kootenai County, it's seven days a week. Mm -hmm. um, it's I get phone calls seven days a week, so I know that, and a lot of times it's, hey, we can't get the bleachers in, what do we do? And we have a couple students at Timberlake that are experts at it, and so <laughs> today one of them's like, you want me to come hunched over and show them? <laughs> yeah, and one guy's probably bigger, one of the students is bigger than Trusty Quimby. Yeah, and we really do call those two out of class because there's times there's four of us. Are they seniors? I mean, yeah, they're yeah, big. We're gonna have a problem next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, they're moving on, so we don't know what the next <laughs> move is. But uh, no, it's a big ask, and whatever you decide, we respect. Uh, well, I guess what I'm asking for is, would you prefer 22 inches or 24 inches between your bleacher seats? Well, we've had. I'm. I feel blessed that you're asking that because I. That's a. It's a big dollar. Um, I think with the rows that will come, we're going to lose a lot of seating. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, other than seeing $200,000, which is a lot of money, mm -hmm. I do think 22 inches is fine. Okay. There, I believe that's where we're at right now. It's, I don't know how much two inches gains you. I mean, we kind of sat down and we're like, two inches, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wouldn't make 22 inch bleachers if those weren't to code and comfortable. Right. Um, so when we do our survey, we send to students each spring and there's a facility question on there. 85% um, of students respond that they think we have adequate, adequate facilities, but then they have a, section they can respond and they put bleachers mm -hmm. um, because for them I think it gets irritating they can't do certain activities in PE or we can't do certain things because I'm like they're stuck whether right. it's in or out or in between sometimes in between mm -hmm. um, and the amount of work it takes I'm a little envious, you know, to see other schools that are able to just, they go in and out. And, like, <laughs> and granted, yeah. um, I mean, I, I'm advo I'd advocate for Lakeland High School the same because I'll, you know, you. I know not my school, but <laughs> that, they do have, that, all, that secondary gym is used a lot too because one thing you, um, the, the two high schools take pride in is we want community there. We want wrestling tournaments. We want basketball tournaments. We want volleyball tournaments. Um, because those do benefit the greater community. And the, the bleachers, it's more about just where you're sitting and if it's, if it's safe, is, is, it, is it usable? Right. I can't speak to theirs if they're usable going in and out, um, but ours are at the point that I do think we're one literal misstep away from a big issue. Okay. And that we've could had cost some. us way more than $200,000. Right. And so, yeah, I'm very appreciative of what you decide. But I needed to stand up here because it is the number one thing I hear about I from it is. everyone. It is. So, thank you. Thank you. Do you thank have any other questions? Yeah, how do we get it under two hundred thousand? So we don't have to go to the formal. Is that what you're? 
<coughs> the optic way the optical current. Well, the the electrical is millimetric, that eleven thousand five hundred. So they were under two hundred thousand. So the bleacher oh, cost is one eighty. Uh, I was going to talk about mill electric is a. Well, that's done separately. Correct. Oh, yeah, they're they're a separate company. I thought it was all one thing. No. Yeah, that's so sort that's of our local electrician that is doing that type of work. Okay. Um, You're a magician. Look yeah. at that. You brought it under 200,000. <laughs> you asked to Yeah. People just tear it out ourselves? Or what do you think about that? I think at least for Timberlake High School, I would have them do it. You guys have a welding shop, right? Well, they've got two students. Our, yeah, <laughs> two. Our fear, our fear was um, if we did, look, we just redid our gym floor. So our fear is if we did the damage, we'd have to cover it. If like they do the damage, they're insured. Right. And so there would have to be damage because mm -hmm. I think the smaller <coughs> bleachers, you know, if you did do like a, the oxygen in the high school, that might be a little easier for a tear out. Um, but they, we I'll asked them, we asked them for the quotes. <laughs> I'll do it for 10. You'll do it for 10? Yeah, I think they're less than that. You get bonded. Yeah. <laughs> you can do that. But, you know, I... No, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> not a lot. Oh, man. But often I think the... Uh, nice try. <laughs> you know, with all the summer projects going on, a lot of times, if, if we're going to move forward, if you have the people that do it all the time, it, yeah. mm -hmm. it, you get a better result. So we, we're looking at each of these separately. So I move that we go with bid or the number one quote, quote number one for the Timberlake High School bleachers. I'll second that. Having a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. <laughs> Moving on to the Lakeland High School bleachers. You don't get to ask for anything for three more years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm excited. So with Lakeland High School, um, there really isn't much difference no. in cost per bum seat. Um, in fact, it's actually, uh, the Vibe Tech quote is actually cheaper per seat than the Montana School equipment. And I like their timeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the timeline yeah. 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 it's much better. Mr. Derrick and Mr. Neff, would you want to be like to speak to this? Well, thanks uh, for considering those those costs. They are substantial. We understand that. Uh, the auxiliary gym bleachers, like have been said, have been there since '79. They actually been moved once because they were on the other side of the gym, and then when we built the new gym, they moved them over to the other side. So they've gone through that move. Right now, we have caution tape on them, similar to what Ryan was talking about, because they're just stuck. You can't move them. So you pull them out and you can't get them back in, or if you got them in, you can't pull them out. So, and we hold a lot of different activities in there, volleyball, uh, sometimes wrestling, little kids, a lot of little kids stuff that we have, community events that we have as well. Um, basketball, obviously, is in there as well. So it is, they're, they're well used. I think we've got, uh, a lot of use out of them, and they've served us well, but it's probably time that we uh, look at mm -hmm. some other options. So, uh, no, we would love to have new bleachers in there. Uh, one of the things, they're manual as well, and uh, I know we've had some workman comp issues with Max, you know, with custodians, yeah. trying to get them in and out uh, also. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, any other questions that you have for us on that? All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other conversation you need to have on that? Right. Okay. Motion. I'll motion to approve the bleachers at Lakeland High School. Which one? Uh, Which one? Biotech. All right. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. None. The motion carries. 
moving on to the Lakeland Middle School bleacher float. I didn't give him the information that we received from Dr. Meyer. Um, if the administration has greater needs than the bleachers, if this is number 12, I'd like to know, you know what one through five is. Um, to know so, one through five. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I yeah. mean, one yeah. through five has a big dollar <laughs> amount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. If but, you want, uh, she's here, but it's up to you if you yeah, want to hear from her. Oh, okay. If you I are, thought she left. Yeah. No, she's here. If you want, it's the yeah, first yes. decision. Um, I hate the idea of turning down anything because anything for that school would be a vast improvement. Um, I think when we were talking, I roughly threw out number 12. We are outgrowing our space in general, and to me, bleachers are kind of lipstick on a pig, which would beautify it, but it is um, the hub of what our community sees when they come in. Like my colleagues have said, our gym is used routinely, and when people come in, the bleachers would definitely beautify it, but we are out of space. We need a second gym. We're utilizing John Brown's gym to just get our PE classes in. Um, as you heard about our life skills population growing, we're out of classrooms. I mean, there's a lot of things as far as additional classrooms, a commons area, a second gym um, that we could use that would help us on a more day-to-day -day basis in functionality than bleachers. Our bleachers are old. Um, they are scary to push in. Fingers feel like they could get chopped at any minute, but um, as far as functionality for to best suit our students in our community right now, um, I think that money could be put to better use, um, whether we are looking at how to expand a gym and get an auxiliary gym, how we can add some classrooms, um, just to make a more long-term improvement for our building. I think there's some other things with that. <coughs> What about maintenance? I mean, those are all, I think, ever probably the, a lot of the schools in the district would have the same thing, but what about maintenance items? I sort of view these mm -hmm. as a maintenance thing, so what about, you know, do you have a maintenance items? I mean, you're there every day, it's things that you see that... Our doors are definitely one, that security. Um, we are looking right now at purchasing more cameras, which comes with more license um, for safety and security of our building. We definitely have some other items um, that would be things that we would want to consider uh, since we've gotten our roofs fixed. I mean, that's improved greatly. Um, even painting the gym, that's a huge item that we have asked for, for a while. I know that our paint crew is down in the summer, so I know that's not always a, but even just painting that and lightening it up, I think giving it a fresh coat of paint would help tremendously too. I agree. Okay. Yeah, so those types of things I think we would be better accomplished than this if the uh, features are mm -hmm. functioning at the moment. And I do respect the whole lipstick on a pig, but oh. it is concerning when the public is going in I, I and they're like, what? I, <coughs> you know, Even people are afraid to touch the bleachers, yeah. you know, that's no. that's I, I completely agree with that. I mean, even when we got our new scoreboard, you can't imagine how many people came in and like, what is new about this gym? <laughs> um, so I think right. anything that we can do right. to brighten that up, because it is where our community goes. Even our parents, most of the time our parents are visiting our school, it's to go to our gym, and that's what we're putting forward. There's right. a lot of wonderful things and beautiful things about our school, um, but when that's what is the perception of what our exactly. law is, mm -hmm. that's exactly. what we have to consider. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <coughs> so at this time, I make a motion that we just table the uh, bleachers for Lakeland Middle School. Okay. I'll second that. Did you have no. a motion? No. 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 Sorry. <laughs> you two. Stop talking. <laughs> the motion is to table. The um, bleacher quote for Lakeland Middle School. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Do you have a motion and a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Hearing none. Oh, you're opposed? Okay. We have one nay. That's all right. It's well, okay. We can oh, have no, no, no. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we can have more discussion. <laughs> Did you want to have more discussion, Bob? Okay. I'm Sh sorry. Who seconded the motion? Uh, I did. I would like to hear Trustee Jones if he wants to give an explanation of his name. No? Okay. I'm ready to move on. Okay. <laughs> Maybe the public wants to know why you said name. <laughs> it's okay that you said name. Yeah. <coughs> Remember, Discord is good. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
dissension. Oh, dissension, that's what it is. Yeah, not we, we're all in one accord. <laughs> all right, moving on to the discussion items. Uh, we need an IBB update. So, Mr. Jones, Ms. Grissom. I would defer to uh, Trustee Grissom. She's much more articulate than I am. So. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> Let's see how that works. I'll have to remember that for the next time. Um, so the IBB meeting uh, went fairly well. We we're trying to cover all these things. I guess the biggest discussion we're having right now um, is, and I know Mr. Bradbury's here, is coming in alignment with surrounding districts or districts within the state that are the same um, you know, uh, classification. classification, yeah, as, as our schools. So they want to do a one to 10 ratio, one head coach with 10 assistant coaches um, for every 100 students. Um, and then if we go over that student ratio, what this does is that would put more, um, uh, the LEA is asking for more, um, if we write that into the agreement, that they would then be able to hire um, those assistant coaches um, to help with those student population um, of those extra coaches. And, and we did receive information looking at the districts surrounding us or the districts that were the same. Um, one thing I did find interesting on there was that um, a lot of the districts fund their coaching program through, um, and I won't say in totality, but a lot of the funds are uh, fundraising. Okay. Um, so I found that interesting. Um, I understand that we're trying to be competitive because we have Post Falls, Coeur Lane, and then there us as far as coaching staff. Um, so that would create, uh, and those are um, athletics or, or activities directors across the board, whether it's swim, cheer, dance, cross country, and each one had a different ratio, one to 10, one to 12. Um, and they were somewhat in alignment. I think Pondere just sort of does whatever they need to do. Um, you know, there was a, a couple of the school districts that had a set in stone ratio. Um, I think were lower than Lakeland's, if I remember correctly. Um, the the end number, if I remember correctly, was right about thirty five thousand dollars is what it would cost. Increase. Increase, correct, to what we already um, pay in stipends, and also. Um, there was, uh, and I don't remember, I had my notes up, I don't remember, did we keep the red language at the no. bottom of it? We've got rid of the red language, okay. Um, and then we inserted the May hire um, so that it's not a definite hire. That, that's on uh, people who are out on leave. Oh, that was the out on leave one, okay. Right now it's on May 1st, they have to notify the district if they're coming back. And uh, we recommend moving that to March 15th based on a compromise of the group made. Mm -hmm. So, to compromise, okay, wait, wait. So, the recommendation and the compromise of whether they're returning to the district, this is just on the coaching end of it? Yeah. Or this is all staff? Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Okay. A leave of absence. So, if they come this year and say, I need a one year, or we'll say they came last year and said, I need a one year leave of absence, now this year they would have to notify. Hypothetically, it wouldn't go into effect this year. Right, right. But using the dates, they would have to notify HR by the March 15th date on whether they're returning or not. Part of the reasoning behind that is that some of the other surrounding districts are already hiring. Right. Right. And we don't know if we wait all the way till May 1, right. we won't know well, what we need to advertise for. Correct. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion over the. Um, um, so one of the things I guess I'm not sure if any of you watched the video or not in voting in IBB there's a thumbs up yay we all agree thumbs down no I don't agree thumbs sideways it's like 
somewhat agree or neutral or whatever, and that was my vote for the coaching um, stipend. Uh, and, the, and the reason it was is I didn't have necessarily the problem with the language, but my concern is from <coughs> my board hat is that we have so many needs. We just heard mm -hmm. about more teaching needs, more prayer needs, or this need, that need. There are a, a, a wide array, and while I appreciate everything that the, um, because I do think the sports are important too, that they put into the program, um, Last year, it was also heavy focus on sports, you know. Um, right. We did talk about um, also adding to, um, and I think all of these documents are out there for everybody to see, but adding um, a, for hard to fill positions, mm -hmm. um, because for instance, over a year, well, the whole school year, we haven't been able to get an SWT teacher at Apple. Right. We've seen um, over and over, even in the HR reports, all these different types of positions where there's high turnover or we can't hire or whatever. So um, it, it came to the IBB team as um, a type of something. Stipend. St yeah, stipend, or we weren't sure if it was stipend, if it was a hiring bonus, what it would be for SWD is what it came as. Mm -hmm. But as the team started talking about it, you know, we run into more than just the SWD. So what it came to be voted on was hard to fill positions. So whatever becomes a hard to fill position um, gets the stipend. Um, I'm trying to think of what else, what else that we... Um, oh, well, I, can we step back though? We sure. want yep. one coach, 10 assistant coaches per... That's football. No, yeah. Football? Can I clarify? Yes, yes. So, so basically what we did is we got a committee together to decide um, when do we see the need to add another coach. Um, both athletic directors at the high school and at the middle school. Um, in Becky's tenure here, every year she gets questions about, you know, we have a few extra players than we did last year, can we get another coach? We don't really have a policy anywhere stating when can we, do we take it case by case? Um, <clears throat> what's, what's equitable, what's feasible, logistically feasible, things like that. And so we started doing research. Dr. Meyer asked me to put a committee together to look at it. And so um, Trustee Grissom was sharing with you some of the research that we did on that topic. And the current numbers that we have now, the one to 10, is what we're already doing. This, that's what our football program is already doing. Most of those ratios, what I found out in doing the comparison, that ratio is for generally football only. Um, the other sports have like basketball right now. And after doing the research, we found that Lakeland and Timberlake are kind of behind the eight ball um, in comparison with the other districts. Um, like in the basketball program, all of our surrounding neighbors, um, we currently have um, one head coach for the varsity, and that's it. Um, a head coach for the JV team, and a head coach for the C team. Our neighboring districts have a varsity assistant coach um, with, with basketball and the other programs as well. And so coming up with that information, we tried finding verbiage to say, well, do, is there a ratio that we can, that we can feel comfortable at? So we had a long discussion in our in our committee, and we 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 compared what we're doing now, what works, what works as far as safety, uh, players to students, access, um, space, that sort of thing, and we found that our ratio is is pretty much working, and so we kept that one to ten for football. That's for football, where the thirty five thousand dollars. So is on the one to ten, is it one coach per ten athletes? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and with football, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more. I mean, they obviously have more coaches, and that's because there's you have both offense and defense. You have different skill positions on there. There's so many athletes right now. You know, Lakeland's been averaging, you know, about a hundred people, hundred players. Uh, Timberlake's been averaging about seventy to eighty. 
I hear what you're saying, but we don't even offer that for the academic structure of our children. We don't have one teacher and one para per 10 students. You're right. We, we don't do you're that. Right. But it becomes, a, it becomes a space issue. It becomes, a, it becomes being able to manage that many kids. I'm sure the teachers would feel the same way. Yeah, you're right. But it's not like we're we're what I'm what my point is we're not asking for anything that we're not asking for something above and beyond what other districts are doing. In fact, we're behind what other districts are doing. So, are you saying what we're doing doesn't work? I'm saying we could use a lot of help. We could use some more assistance. Does in it our work? Program. But I mean, are you saying that our program hasn't been working? So we need to not, not, this. We need to compete with everybody else and get up to what they're doing, I agree, even huh? though yeah, I agree, our 100%. program's already working. I don't know that our. I think our programs could be better with the use of. Everything can be improved. Yes, yeah. I'm just more, um, I guess, disappointed that we think that a one to ten ratio is more important in athletics. No, I than, I don't think, than in the classroom because don't we don't do that in the classroom. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that's I don't think that's what it's about. In a classroom, they're they're contained in a classroom. Uh, maybe I can speak to that a little bit because I, I I share some of what you're okay what you're saying, but from a safety standpoint, particularly in some of the sports mm -hmm. where you know kids can get spread out. You know, one group can be off doing something if you don't have enough supervision to make sure that they're staying on task. That that can become a safety issue or sometimes a discipline issue or, or other kinds of things. So from that aspect, you know, I can see the validity of what's being suggested. But keep in mind that what has been outlined is a kind of laundry list of all the all the sports activities and the number of coaches be anticipated for each of those sports and all of that language will go into the negotiated agreement and it is not there now mm -hmm. and so it's a difference between kind of you know what we're doing as a protocol or as a suggested list as opposed to what will be written into the language of the negotiated agreement <coughs> we did agree that the addition of coaches on a ratio of one to ten would be a permissible thing, but not a required thing. So let's say we are at 110 athletes in football, and suddenly we have 130, which would suggest that we need two more coaches. Maybe they're not available. Maybe you just can't find them. Mm -hmm. And the last thing we want to do is just put a warm body in there who doesn't either have experience or responsibility of supervision students. So yeah, we need to be very careful about that aspect. I absolutely agree, and I'm not anti-sports at all. I just am <clears throat> frustrated at the thought that we're willing to spend more money um, in athletics than we're willing to spend in a classroom. Because I think that if we need to focus money somewhere, um, build up the opportunity to work in the educational arena. But again, that's my opinion. Um, and I guess I'll wait to see what the language is in the negotiated agreement. I get what he's saying though, because one year in wrestling, we got 89 kids come out. You can handle that. Well, I think, was there, Trent, was there two paid coaches for wrestling? There's three. three. Yeah. There's three. So we have a split. You had to split the stipends yeah. of mm -hmm. each coach, mm -hmm. and we were running two practices. Mm -hmm. so we were there from. Three o'clock till seven o'clock at night for two because we had so many kids, you know. I hear you. I, I'm just, I'm just no, and again, you know, it's just adjusting to. I mean, we never adjusted for the amount of kids. I don't think ever the other sports don't. Mm -hmm. Football does. Football gets ten or whatever they get, but the other sports suffer. Like Jason said, to be more competitive, but <clears throat> I don't know if you put on more volunteers or or what, but it's hard to find people too, you know. Right. No, I get you. I think you just get that. trying to find a way to make it better, you know. Oh, and I don't know, there's no disrespect here. I get what no, you're trying to no, do no, in I making just, the program better. Yeah. 
my struggle is when the focus is on athletics, and yet we have over some crowded classrooms, we don't have enough teacher or, or yeah. warm body to student ratio. I, I mean, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, it's it just, I mean, it's, yeah this is just one, one aspect of- I get it, on, I so. do get it, but yeah. I just am, I'm amazed. I don't think that anybody's saying that the, the, this topic is the priority. I think it just is a subject that just came up this evening as part of what was discussed in IBB. I don't think that it was ever recommended that it was the priority. No, nothing really takes a priority, like a laundry list mm -hmm. comes, and then everybody says, you know, yeah, let's go through this. What do, what do we think we can get through that's at least mm -hmm. amount of discussion? Um, but the agreement mm -hmm. at the table um, is what does end up in the agreement, mm -hmm. and then the agreement comes to the board to approve. Um, I guess my, my, um, uneasiness with it is that I don't want to make the board's decision on the language that goes into the thing. And that's sort of my role, I've been told. Um, but I have uneasiness about the whole IBB thing um, just because of, and I know they've been doing this a couple of years and maybe this is another thing. Um, I don't have any more questions for, I don't want to make Jason sound so oh, there the whole time. <laughs> you can if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> Stay close. Uh, yeah, don't go away. Just from don't experience, I guess what I would encourage the board to do, and it's the same with the budget team that Randy, uh, Trustee Bain is on, and then for the IBB, the Trustee Grissom and Jones, for the healthy functioning, I guess I would just encourage the board to read the notes and the minutes, and you legally can reach out to that one representative and say, hey, I have some questions about this. How is this? How is that? So you can certainly have this open discussion, but also you legally can reach out to one of your fellow board members and say, tell me more about this so you have more informed. You can also reach out to Jason or I um, or CFO Wallace or uh, Assistant Superintendent. <coughs> we are on it and, and, or HR Director Cunningham. So you could reach out to any of us individually only because when you come to the discussion part, the decision-making process at the end of IBB, Trustee Grissom saying, what I hear her saying, she also said at our meeting is, I don't want to make all these decisions everywhere, every step along the way, and we come to the final and you guys are like, wait, why, why are you doing this? So I just encourage questions along the way, because it is a big document, we do have a long list of things, mm -hmm. um, but the intent is that these are your representatives that are not necessarily voting for you, but they're trying to think through the will of the board <coughs> as far as, what the board they think might be the the needs of the board for the future. And I guess I'm not. I don't have a clear. I mean, I know how I feel. We're not statutorily obligated to anything with sports. We're statutorily obligated to academics. Although I know they play a, a part in the student overall uh, development. I get that. But knowing the other needs that we have in the district, I have a hard time doing anything more for sports. Every time I look at the bills, I have a hard time looking at the amount of money we spend sports, 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 and we have no curriculum. Well, we don't have a lot of needs of approved curriculum in places, and that bothers me. We have schools that need more repair, and, and from my point of view, and it's not saying that one's more important than the other, that's not what I'm saying, but if I'm looking from a total picture, I see lots of needs, and this isn't, you know, it's like number 12 on the list. <laughs> um, so that's all I'm saying, but I, I uh, you know, the other thing is, is I would encourage the board to read um, Title 33, 1272 of the Idaho Code, and also decide on where the board wants to go with that, because I don't even know that that's been established, which is the full negotiation of IDB and how it's supposed to be. Um, it was title 33 what? Uh, 12, 72. 71. Oh, 71. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I'm not, I don't have all of that. Uh, Mr. Bradbury was kind enough to send an email and he did send it to all of us <coughs> saying, you know, this is how many uh, teachers we have, this is how many belong to the LEA, blah, 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 but 
you know me, I'm going to go back to here and say, are we really following this thing? Or at least bring the documentation forward that says, yes, we are following it. And, and um, now that I'm sitting here the second year, I just want to make sure that we're doing that too. Um, I, the, in that the section of calls a question whether or not the association has sufficient numbers to justify them representing. Yeah, well, it's not call it, it's an establishment, yes. Right. Yeah. So do you have enough to establish, right. but it's all about documentation, so it's not only the, the documentation. Well, clearly they do. Uh, well, we think they do, I don't know. I haven't well, based seen. on the numbers that Jason says. So. Right, right, but I'm saying, that's what I'm asking the board, is yeah. that is sufficient enough? Um, you know, according to what it says, um, and also, um, just everything it says about establishing the representative on an annual basis, the board's supposed to approach the LEA or the LEA is supposed to approach the board to enter into these negotiations. Um, and then there's supposed to be establishment of last two years um, in, the, in the documentation. So, uh, Anyways, I just thought I would, I would bring that up. Plus we spoke about other things, um, um, clarification of some language so the teachers understood what some of the payout was um, and things like that. And then we still have a, a long list um, of, of other things to go through. If, but we'll be finished in a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, do you need to see official documentation on those numbers? Are you saying that you don't trust that what I've said? Well, it's not right. a matter of trust. It's a matter of establishing what we're statutorily obligated. And well, that's email what I mean. I isn't typically yeah. a, a binding. Like, I don't know how the LEA works. Like, I don't know if you have a... I, that's why I asked the board what the board wants because it's supposed to be a this conversation between the LEA and the board and I feel like we haven't had this conversation. Um, so I'm just trying to establish that. Again, it's a, a protocol thing, right? What is the board's protocol for this type of engagement? Um, are, are you talking in concerns to interest-based bargaining or negotiating? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think what I, what the way I take it is, um, you know, a few weeks ago, we, or I think it's even been a month or two ago, is when our new trustees came on. We talked about IBB. We approached the board, talked to you about that process and what we do. Um, we don't have weekly meetings. The LEA used to present to the board every single time, but there's been some some new new laws and statutes mm -hmm. in there that kind of there's there's kind of a fine line about what we can say and what we can't say. Um, oh yeah, no, no. I was asking the board, like, what does the board want to do with this? Because that's what it says. What does the board want to establish this thing? You know, um, so that's why I brought it up. Because in a, a I guess I'm confused as to, you mean as far as do we continue IBB or do we continue negotiating? What, what, what you mean? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's, I have seen nothing established in writing that this is the protocol, this is how you, you know, the board comes to you or we come, the, you know, there's, there's nothing established and I don't know how the board wants to establish that. At least I've seen nothing that's been yeah. established, you know. How do we meet these, um, you know, these things that are that are laid out in statute. Um, that's a, that's all I'm bringing to the board. Um, Just to get their input on that. Maybe a question of Dr. Moir. Um, I don't know what the current situation is exactly. In the past, and Jason, you would, would remember this, we had, <coughs> we had a, a mutually agreed upon uh, document that says how negotiations take place. Separate from that, you have the negotiated agreement. Mm -hmm. Do we have the first document in place? I. We, we have our training it, document that we have for our um, that we did the training document, and it has our, uh, everything that you've talked about. It has how we approach each other is with mutual trust, that whole entire training document, and then we have the ground rules the why. Yeah, I know that, but uh, the, the, the question is, do we have anything 
formally in place that says the LEA will be the representative group and that the board has agreed to the terms of the, uh, not the negotiated agreement, but the agreement to negotiate? I would have to research that. I, I don't know. I've just been in it so long and under so many different right. superintendents well, and that I, we've you know, I've never been. Kind of the same way, but as yeah. you know, the question arises, yeah. it kind of goes back to that issue of the fact that you know, we had a formal agreement that said, you know, the LEA will be the representative group you know, for the for the teachers, and it outlined you know certain steps to come together for the purpose of negotiations. And then from there, I seem to remember the reading that document. I I just can't tell you off the top of my head where it is yeah. or where it came from. But I'll, I'll research. Well, I know where it came from. Dick Snook wrote it originally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was reviewed, and it was it, it was reviewed upon occasion, but not necessarily every year, because it was an in place document. That's all I was bringing up. I just, I, I'm just asking for. No, I'm certainly. Yeah, you know, it's tangible. Yeah. This is how we do it. This is yeah. why we're doing it. And the other thing is, is that, um, even though we look nothing like the national uh, teachers yeah. associations, yeah. that's the climate we're in, right? Yep. And for transparency, we, I think we owe it to the community to. You bet. And I'd like to do that. Them. In fact, yeah. I've. You know, I'm more than willing to sit down with any board member. I'd like to do it with all five, but we can't do that unless it's official. Sure, but, sure. you know, it'd be nice if there could be, you know, some sort of dialogue, you know, whether it's weekly or every other week, not just in a typical board meeting that we can just, you know, let you know the goings on or what we're, what we're all about and what we're talking about and things we're working on. Yeah. I would like. I I wish we could find. I will research that because yeah, I know the document awesome. he's talking about. I just yeah. I'll, I'll find it. I, I you know I've got a lot of old files at home, but I don't think I have that one. No, I'll look. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it sounds like through IBB the wheels are turning. Yes. Okay, that's a good thing. Well, I tell you what, I'm yeah. learning a lot with this new process. It's a you know it's a little different process than what was used. Learning is good. It's much more congenial. It's much more of a, a, collaborative a team effort, yeah, instead of a us against them kind of thing, and everybody's going to their corners. There are some advantages to that, to yeah. that, but there are some disadvantages too. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can always uh, call for a break and go to our corners because we have done that. Um, but it is good that you know, there's a little bit of representation from everybody and in input. Um, I have appreciated that because you do get different um, perspectives, right? you know, and I have found that, um, you know, uh, everybody just speaks their piece and we go along with the meeting and uh, Dr. Meyer is very good at the start and the end. Practice. <laughs> I, appreciate you target. I appreciate that, yep. <laughs> okay. Next up for discussion is a budget committee update. Yes, Ben, can you close us into what's been going on? Um, I, Brian's just really given a an in-depth look at how the budget is created, but until the legislative session was over and those decisions were made, and we haven't really even gotten into the budget. The budget. Yep. Oh. Yep. So. All right. There you go. Thank you. There's your update. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, is there any uh, input for future agenda items? Not telling you anything. Oh, come on. I think we have a fairly good list somewhere. <laughs> yeah. We've done such a uh, good job of filling out the agenda. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that it isn't me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just come along and say, okay. <laughs> All right. Then uh, I would like to move uh, that we enter into executive session for Idaho Code 742061 b Motion and a second. We need a roll call vote. Trustee Ellis? Yes. 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 Trustee 
Trustee Quinn. Yes. Trustee Bain. Yes. Yes. Chair Thompson. Vice Chair. Yes. Yes. Trustee Jones. Move into executive session. We'll take that. Right, I like your box. Thanks. Is it possible to get any Yeah. Okay, so we've come out of executive session, and I will entertain any motions at this time. I will move to ratify administration's decision regarding employee 4.13.22A and approve the letter of direction. Second. Hearing motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, the motion carries. I move to approve the recommendation for the head football coach who is presented. Yeah, Lakeland High School. At Lakeland High School. A second. Hearing a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. I move to approve administration's recommendation for teacher of Lakeland School District Teacher of the Year. Second. Hearing a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And that concludes the executive session. It's 10.30. Or the, the meeting, not the executive session, the meeting. It's late. <laughs> go home, go to bed. I do want to find out about these bathrooms.